Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is Monday, January 11th, coming to you from New York City. And no better guest to have in New York City than a native New Yorker, and that is my guest today, Mr. J.J. French of Twisted Sister. I always look at Twisted Sister, I think that everybody knows who they are because, of course, they're giant, giant famous uh, hits. We're not going to take it, and I want to rock. And the uh, humongous uh, videos that they had during that era on MTV and anybody that grew up around then, you could not escape that era of Twisted Sister. But when you really think about it, Twisted Sister to me is way, way more than those two videos. And uh, uh, that's a um, a product of uh, watch out what you get famous for. People, A lot of people always say that for. Are you famous for those videos? Um, which is great for them. They've been able to have an amazing, um, you know, long, long career and make a living because they have a couple humongous, humongous hits. But also, uh, the unfortunate side of that is some people only know them for that. But if you watch their incredible documentary that I've talked about before on this podcast called uh, Twisted Fucking Sister, you'll realize that this is a true, true band that slugged it out for years. And they were a well-rehearsed, uh, machine, an actual punch to the face, one of the most potent rock bands that uh, is very, very un- underrated. And uh, if you watch that, you're going to, even if you don't like Twisted Sister or you're not into that kind of music, it's really a, uh inspirational film because no matter what, they kept going. And it definitely... Uh, there's points in my career where I'm constantly like, wow, man, what the fuck am I doing? You know, at 52 years old, I've, uh, only know one thing and it's, uh, constantly chasing and, uh, being on stage and, and, uh, going for some kind of weird tick that's in my brain, something that makes me, uh, not, not be able to uh, just chill and settle down a constant drive to want to do art and perform and uh, see things and learn things and and travel uh it does get harder as you get older you know here i am 52 and i'm out there running a young man's game but i can't imagine doing anything else you know and there is giant ups and there's giant downs my guest today comes on J.J. French, guitar player for Twisted Sister, and he lays it out there. All the shininess is uh, often goes away, and uh, you sit around and wonder, was it worth it? And it's great to ask him that question, and he really tells me uh, if it was or not, which is just an honest, honest interview. This man went from uh, drug dealing in the 70s then joined a band, turned it into a, uh, a behemoth, selling millions of records, making millions of dollars, losing it all, and becoming a pool hall manager, uh, working late nights in a pool hall with nothing. That, you know, pretty much is how all those behind the musics used to go. He then later got a job selling hi-fis, stereos, and uh, eventually started managing bands, hit it again. Then Twisted Sister had its second second wind. And, uh, you know, he's, he's enjoying a second blast. And then he recently finds out that he had been diagnosed with cancer. He beats cancer, and now we sit down and talk in New York City And this guy is definitely a soldier and an inspiration to me and uh, to a lot of you, I'm sure, if you watch the film and listen to this podcast. I can't thank him enough for doing it. 
I've seen Twisted Sister many times over the years, including that last time in L.A. at the Roxy with uh, Ricky Rackman, the Cat House 35th anniversary, uh, a show that actually knocked me out. Uh, and he was a perfect guest because, you know, uh, sometimes in my comedy career, I don't know where the fuck I'm, I'm at, what am I doing. Um, I know I do love what I'm doing, but uh, sometimes you're like, whoo, man. Uh, one of those times was Thursday night, and it's a perfect example to let you guys know. As much as I love going out on the road and trying to do shows, when uh, people don't show up, it's a brutal blow uh, to the sails. It takes the wind out of your sails, and uh, and you you know you you got to go back and regroup. And Thursday night in Boston, instead of looking at wow. This is cool. 40 people came to see me. I was more like, wow, only 40 people in a giant city. Uh, you know, it was definitely tough, but I was surrounded by great, great friends. And that's probably what got me through it. And the next day I realized, you know what? Those 40 that came, fuck yeah, those guys are cool. That was great. The set was great. The people were great. We went and ate some... Uh, breakfast and uh you know and then i uh got on the amtrak and uh took it all in so yeah definitely uh definitely if you do ask me to come to your cities and stuff i'm i'm looking at a new game plan of just do comedy in new york and la like residencies like these vegas acts and you can come out and see me there man uh, until something changes later on because it's definitely uh, costs a lot of money and a lot of time and it's uh, it's uh, it's a rough one so in the meantime I'll just do comedy in New York and LA and just get funnier and work on it and then one day hopefully something changes in the meantime I will keep doing this podcast and working on my material I love all you guys, and I'm glad you guys tune in. Let's give a shout-out to some excellent donators. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey is where you donate, or you can email me at DeanDelRay.com. Um, that's my website, and shout at me if you want to shoot a donation. Sam Gordon and Jamie Salvatore, thank you for your donations to the Let to Be Talk podcast. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out here. Some music recommendations for you guys. My favorite band, The Mother Hips, has a brand new record out called Chorus. It came out Friday. And you guys know I absolutely worship these guys and talk about grinders and talk about being in the biz all their life. That's this fucking band playing music 28 years. And uh, they should be way bigger than they are. And, you know... I think that uh, this record, I think that a lot of you guys are going to love it. A lot of you guys are going to love it. There's some great, great songs on it. Uh, I love the first two, Clean Me Up and Didn't Pay the Bill. Amazing. I love this song, January, and the last track, Meet Me on the Shore. These guys have a great record. Get it. Go to iTunes or wherever you buy your vinyl and pick it up. Also, another great uh, record that I kind of uh, didn't give enough love to because I was so busy listening to their full length is this Mastodon EP. What's those sirens? That's some New York right there. Sirens. Sirens! They will race in. Spotlight! <laughs> Jailbreak. Bon Scott. Uh, Mastodon, that EP, I've dug back in on it, man, Cold Dark Place, and uh, been really rocking that thing lately, God, what a great, great EP, I just kind of, the record, you know, the record they put out, I just, I was engulfed in that, and just didn't take in the EPs uh, all the way in, and then uh, also I'm back on All Them Witches, so those are my record music recommendations this week also i want to give a little shout out to my old school um my old school uh motorcycle sponsor just because i was in poughkeepsie on saturday headlining 
That was fun, man, to go upstate New York. I'd never been up there. It was uh, just seeing more of America. I've seen a lot of America, but all the major cities. So to get outside of stuff is really cool. I was at Poughkeepsie, and what a great, great night. Uh, great, great people that put that show on. And I, I was up there, and I saw all kinds of people ride motorcycles. I was like, God, this is where you ride. No texters, you know, people, people watching the road. You could just be out on your, your Harley. El Cajon Harley. I'm giving them a little shout-out. It's not an ad. I just, uh, It's just a uh, sending some love to them because they really helped the podcast for a couple years uh, a while back. Elcoenharley.com. Hit up my boy Greg Riley. Get yourself a motorcycle this summer. I'm missing mine. I'm not riding here in New York, but I do love walking the streets. I just dig walking the streets and riding the subway. It's so so loony. Uh, also, I got to uh, meet uh, Diego, the guy that um, designed that new Dean Del Rey Escape from the Thin Wall Apartment t-shirt. So that was so cool to meet him. He's an amazing artist, and he was at the Poughkeepsie show. Uh, big love to everybody that's been seeing me at the cellar and the stand all month. Uh, I'm still here. Come on out. Enjoy the ride. I'm going to go see that David Bowie uh, exhibit in Brooklyn this week. I'll give you guys some uh, love on that, and I'll be back on serious volume channel on um let's see here the volume channel on june 20th talking talking some us festival so that'll be fun upcoming show at the end of the month i'll be at the comedy cellar at the rio hotel june 27th through july 1st get your tickets at my website dean del rey.com also subscribe to the youtube channel dean del rey and leave reviews on iTunes everywhere. I love you guys. Let's get into some JJ French here with the candles lit. See ya. All right, here we are. Another episode of Let the Me Talk. Fantastic guest, a perfect New York City guest, JJ French, Twisted Sister. How are you, dude? Oh, I'm fine, man. How are you doing? I I, uh, I walk in and I already know we're going to have an insane conversation because we uh, love all kinds of the same stuff. You love uh, high-end uh, hi-fi stuff. You got a VPI turntable, which I saw. Uh, you, you think your dream is to do stand-up. And you played rock and roll, so we're exactly the same. I played rock for 25 years, now I do comedy. Well, we've been doing comedy for all our lives, but I guess some people said we were a rock band. <laughs> so, Also, see, you're from the West Coast, yep. so you say dude, and we just go, yo, motherfucker, over here on the, on the East Coast, because we don't say dude. On, you know, it's, it's really a kind of cultural thing, because every time I'm in L.A., it's like, dude, dude, dude. In New York City, it's just, what's up, motherfucker? What's up? Like all the guys on my neighborhood, that's yeah. all they, you know. That's all they say, because I've lived here all my life, so. Yeah, all your life. Yeah, all here, here. Right in this place. Right, I heard right you got, here. this was your mom's house. Yeah, my parents. This is fucking unbelievable. I've never been up this far, you know, we're uptown, and. Um, You're actually in probably the center of the geographical Manhattan. I mean, it's the Upper West Side, but then you have Harlem, you have Washington Heights, you have Inwood. That goes up to 212th Street, you know. So like you're you're in you're in the 90s. So like you're kind of actually in the center. But for all intents and purposes, most of the action in New York happens uh, below 125th Street. Right. It used to be below 96th, but gentrification has now pushed that up. Right. And now Harlem is so gentrified. I mean, there were some neighborhoods in Harlem that I used to go to as a hippie druggie that you'd be murdered, like in 10 seconds where drive-by shootings were a national sport, and now it's five grand a month to live up there. Yeah. Know? So it's really changed. Brooklyn's really changed. And the neighborhoods in Brooklyn that used to be really bad totally. are just gentrified. Yeah, so, Williamsburg, Fort Greene, Greenpoint. Listen, man, Point, we, Greenpoint. our murder rate, I mean, the best way to describe it is, I think less than 300 people get killed a year in New York City. To put that in perspective, back when the son of Sam, you, yeah, you I remember that? Back when he was killing people in 76 and 77, 
Um, we had 4,000 murders in those two years. 4,000? Yeah, we were averaging 2,000 murders a year for a lot of time. And, and in fact, there's one day in 1972 where we had 56 murders in a day. In New Holy York shit! So it was Wild West, you know, back yeah. then. And uh, I, I, I remember even early on, and where the first time I came, like 42nd Street and everything, was just like, whoa, this is weird. Yeah, but that was what year for you? What year was that? Uh, you? In the 90s. Yeah, well... Imagine being on 42nd Street in the 50s. Wow. And the 60s. Yeah. So that's where I grew up because yeah. I first, my father worked on 47th Street. And when I was 10, I went down, uh, he took me down there. He used to also drive me down to the Bowery where CBGB's uh, oh, yep. used to yep. be. And that was all just uh, homeless men, you know, alcoholics on the street. It was just Bowery Mission. And it was gray and depressing and drunk sleeping on the streets this is in the 50s my father used to tell me you know you see this this is what happens if you drink and smoke pot and and now i'm thinking if my father was alive well you you know dad right now this is where you go if you got millions of dollars yeah. and you're probably dealing weed and also yeah. dealing blow because you can't even afford to buy a place around there and yet it was the epitome of dark uh, depressing new york uh, you know so i grew up in the dark depressing times I grew up and it kind of got better like in the 60s and it got really bad in the 70s. It started to come back in the 80s. It started to retrench in the 90s. Times Square was dangerous but fun. I mean, it was fun. It was dangerous. Right. But to a New Yorker, we liked the porno, all the porn theaters and the, you know, and the kung fu movies and the junkies on 8th Avenue. There was a certain, I don't know how to put this, a certain comfort level. Yeah, of a knowing, funk. A, a cool funk, funk. Yeah, cool funk. The hookers were there. And you know what? If you're a New Yorker, nobody bothers you. I mean, they can always tell the difference between who's a New Yorker and who's not because a New Yorker never looks up. Yeah. Tourists look up all the time, you know? New Yorkers don't bother looking up. We don't care. Also... A little tip for those of you who really want to, who are stuck in a bad neighborhood and, and don't want to be bothered. If you get a set of house keys, pull them out and just start jingling them. If you jingle house keys, people tend to think you live in the neighborhood, so they don't tend to bother you. Wow, good trick. So, uh, you know, like I used to go up in the really bad neighborhoods in Harlem and stuff, I just take my keys out, walk around. People, oh yeah, he's from around here. They don't like to bother people from around the area, like right. to bother people from outside the area. These are little techniques you get to survive it you know yeah. but i was you know when i was 10 i was shot in the neck with a bb gun around the corner and then i was involved in an armed robbery and almost murdered in my building here right here yeah i had a gun put to my head and then and then um about five years after that i was robbed at gunpoint in central park and i was probably robbed five times at knife point had knives put to my throat in various locations in new york city doing crazy shit in the 60s you know being a hippie, getting high, doing drugs in neighborhoods. I mean, there's a sushi place right now that's located in a doorway on St. Mark's Place that probably you bought heroin in the 60s, right? right? And right. now it's like you can't, ex you can't afford to buy sushi there because yeah. it's so freaking expensive. And so it's funny. You know, you walk down these streets where you remember, man, this was like the worst area you could imagine you would never walk alone you got to be with 10 guys you know yeah and now it's shishi fufu super expensive the city is kind of um it's kind of i call it a uh, hermetically sealed bubble of real estate bullshit that's yeah. what i call manhattan we are an island surrounded by 17 bridges and tunnels you can't get in or out the reason why there's no drive-by shootings is because you got to stop at the next light yeah, I mean, think about it, man. You can, well, you just got to stop. I mean, you shoot someone, get in your car, and you're stuck behind three garbage trucks, four school buses, five police cars, ten Ubers, five Vias. <laughs> you can't go anywhere. That's why nobody gets kidnapped off the street. You can't go anywhere. Yeah. I mean, we live in this, like, like I said, a hermetically sealed bubble of real estate bullshit where you could look at my apartment and see buildings that are selling apartments for like 80, 90, 100 million dollars. Wow. Two, two million bucks in New York is, is middle class housing. Shh. You know, it really is crazy, and that's why, unfortunately, sadly, young people um, oh, can't, I've been, can't I've been live here. I've been they looking for a place. I've been looking for a place for a month. It's yeah. uh, I've just like I've just slowly just become depressed. Yeah. Because they open it up, and it's like the size right there, and they go, "There you go. It's uh, twenty four hundred. Yeah. Or how about like a space for your car? Is is the space right there? And that's um. That's 800 a month. Yeah. Just to park your car in, a, in an enclosed area. In fact, some 
condos I was reading, one of them sold a parking space for eight hundred and ten thousand yeah. dollars. You know, so like I said, it's a crazy place to live, crazy place to grow up. You know, I've grown up here all my life, so I don't necessarily consider this place a high energy location. Yeah. Because it's been here all my life. It's like I can go to sleep at ten o'clock and I don't think about it. Um, however, my daughter growing up here, I explained to her when she was growing up, I said, if you can consider New York as nothing, in other words, you travel it, you don't care, you're on the trains, it's, this is not a big deal to you, then nothing will be a big deal to you anywhere. Right. Which is why New Yorkers kind of have an edge wherever they go. The other thing about New York City, which is, I think, spectacular, I mean, we're going off on a little bit of a tangent. No, it's this great. This is what I love about my, my city, is that... Um, in almost every other city, there's a right side of the tracks and a wrong side. So if you're not of that certain financial level, you don't see certain things. You can close your eyes to it. You can pretend it doesn't exist. But in New York City, man, I don't care how rich or how poor you are. The minute you walk down, the minute you're on the street and you're on the street, you're, in you're it. with everybody. Everybody. And when, when you're on the train, you're with everybody. Oh, yeah. I read somewhere that uh, it's one in, one in eight or one in five are millionaires. So I said, well, there's like 20 of them in each car on the uh, subway. Well, they'll all take the subway. Yeah, exactly. You know, and then, and then another thing is in the borough of Queens, I believe 158 languages are spoken. It's the most, wow. It is the most spoken language location on earth. In the borough of Queens. That's incredible. So we have enormous cultural diversity. And because we do, we don't have fear. Because a lot of times uh, racism, um, um, ignorance is based on the fact what, that you don't, you don't know. know. Right. Right? Yep. You don't know these people. Yeah. You don't interact with them. What is this? What is this? Who yeah. are they? The boogeyman has told me they're this. But you don't have that in New York, man. Yeah. In New York, it's like you, you tend to take people for what they are personally. Good guy, bad guy but not defined by color, cultural, race, color religion, race, anything. money, religion, nothing. It's totally. like, you know, I love that part of New York City. I love this city. I, love uh, I grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco. It is a lot like New York. It was a melting pot. I never really, uh, all my friends were different colors, races, everything, you know. So uh, when I get here, it, it really gives me that energy times a thousand, you know. And I really love that about it. Uh, it helps me with comedy. It opens up my eyes to write way more broad, and mm -hmm. uh, and I see other things to to write about. Like right now, I've cut you know ten minutes on shitty apartments here, hunting. Yeah, which is great, you know. Yeah. So if you had does, a kid, you could you could do two hours on trying to find a school for the kid. Too. Wow, it's crazy. So I said to my daughter growing up here, I said, "Here's the thing, sweetheart. I said, people around the world dream to be here." I said, you don't necessarily get up in the morning and say, Dad, I want to go to Dubuque, Iowa, do you? Yeah. You don't tell me you want to go to Lincoln, Nebraska. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Lincoln, right. Nebraska. Nothing wrong with Columbus, Ohio. These are great places, wonderful places. But the fact is, probably those kids, they want to be here or L.A. or maybe London or Paris or That's something. That's it. I said, but when you're living here, you're so culturally enriched that you may say to me, Dad, I want to go to L.A. or I want to go to Paris. But you're not necessarily saying, I want to go to Akron, Ohio, nope. necessarily. So this is... Uh, the beauty of being in the epicenter of Western civilization at this time in mankind history. I only hope that we live long enough that we don't get destroyed by uh, by uh, nuclear weapons. Yeah. Uh, you know, for several more generations. But it is a it is a certainly a unique uh, place to grow up. And I've been in my apartment for my entire life. In fact, this plant that you see behind me. Yeah. This plant here. Yep. Was given by my father to my mother. On her 49th birthday in 1967. So this plant what? is celebrating um, in two weeks its 51st birthday sitting there. That's insane. Re replanted six times. It's named after my mom. Evelyn. You know what it it's reminds named, me of? That's my mom. That's a picture there, Evelyn. That's named, called Evelyn, and that's what it's named after. My father gave it to my mother in 1967 for her birthday, which is on June 20th. So it's coming up in two weeks. It'll be 51 years oh my that God. it's been sitting in this apartment. That's insane. <laughs> it reminds me of the guy in the uh, world record book with the longest fingernails. The bottom part there. You know, he had those fingernails oh, that, that wrapped curled. around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in the bottom part of this tree. I can't even believe, how do you keep a plant alive that long? Uh, like, you know, I, I guess when you were, 
huge and twisted sister did you move out of here for a while um yeah i moved around the world and but but when i did move out my father was alive still so he had the apartment uh, then i was married and we toured but you know i was always back but this thing gets watered once a month wow so i water it usually the first day of the month and then it's good to go that's and then, insane and then on the rare occasions if i'm going to be gone for six weeks my brother lives up the street he'll come down and water but i've never had anybody water it for me i mean this thing is a is a set it and forget it plant yeah um believe me I'm as astonished as you because when people come in here and they go, how do you make that happen? I said, I have no idea. Is that a record, do you think? Could I, you look I, it up? I don't know. I never bothered to look it up. But I do know that when my father gave it to my mother, you know, it was sat on a table, yeah. a little pot with eight leaves. He, he, uh, he uh, attached a $20 bill to each leaf with a paper clip. Uh -huh. So, you know, it was, you know, it was $160, whatever. So I guess that was the most cash my, my mother ever saw, I think, because my father didn't make a lot of money. And um, and now you look at it, you know, and it's um, look at the pot is yeah. huge. Well, pot, Where'd pot, you get a pot yeah. like that? Well, I can't get a bigger one. I mean, this is the end. I'm wow. not, not going to transplant it anymore. So what happens is, so I transplanted it two years ago, and the the earth settles. So every year I'll buy another 25 pound bag of earth so that there's nutrients going in it. Oh my god, I got to get a picture. But of I, that can't, thing. I can't, I uh, can't, I can't do anything more with it because it's ridiculous. I got to take a picture of that dude. <laughs> Let, let me ask you, so I don't know, how many bedrooms here? Uh, this, uh, it's, it's, it can be a two or a three. It's two, but three. I'm reconfiguring it into a three in a couple of months. We're going to re redo you, the You're apartment. hooking me up with a room, right? Oh, or sure. Renting a room. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> 8,000 a month. No problem. <laughs> well, the reason I'm asking, so uh, it's you and brother, that's it? Well, I'm married. I, I'm saying in your family but my when you're growing me and my up. Brother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so well, my brother's 10 years older, so... I never, I don't have really any memories of growing up with him. Right. Because, you know, by the time I was 10, he was out. And frankly, when I, when the Beatles hit, I was 10 and my life turned upside down seeing the Beatles. I, then my brother became like a completely non-issue in my life, except that he did teach me how to play guitar. Wow. Me for my first chords. He, he played guitar? Yeah, he was a good folk guitar player. He still is a good player. I mean, he's a really, not a rock and roller at all. He's like more of a beatnik. He's 10 right. years older, you know? So he came out of the beatnik era of the, of the village. The folks singing Kingston Trio, Peter, Paul, and oh, Mary, yeah. that, you know, that kind of stuff. Yep. And my, my parents played the Weavers music a lot. They were a very famous folk group and Harry Belafonte and stuff like that. And my brother played folk music in the village. I remember t going down and watching him play in Washington Square Park, like the, like the yeah. beatniks, you know, in the 60s. And he showed me how to Travis pick, which is a particularly intricate form oh, of picking, which I've never had to use in my entire professional life, yeah. but I know how to do it. And so he taught me at the age of 10. And then, and then I don't know, I kind of went into like some frozen mode where I didn't really play for a couple of years. And then, and then uh, by 1965... I wanted to be in a in a band, you know, because you know now I mean the Beatles are in full swing, and and I really desperately wanted to be in a band. So um, there was a talent show in my junior high school. Now I'm very fortunate where I live in Manhattan because my public school is one block that way. Wow. My junior high school is one block that way, and my high school is four blocks that way. Wow. Right? So they're all very close. So now I'm in junior high school. It's 65. And uh, there's a drummer named Paul Herman and a Chinese kid who lived in the projects named Bing Gong. His name was Bing Gong. Yeah. Bing was a singer. Paul was a drummer. And, I, and Paul had a Sokova guitar, some real cheap Japanese guitar, and a Kent amplifier, some real cheap thing. And we jammed at his apartment a block away, and we played uh, two songs. We jammed... Um, Bob Dylan's like a Rolling Stone. Awesome. And, and um, the Fugs, I couldn't get high. I don't know if you know who the Fugs yep. were, but and for and I wasn't getting high yet, but I just thought it was a funny song. So we then proceeded to play at the talent show. So I think and they called because it was John, I'm John and Paul and Bing, we called it John Paul and Bingo. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean that was the name of the band. So we, we squirrely go squirrely version of the Beatles. Squirrely very, very squirrely. <laughs> And so we go on stage and we played these, we played like a Rolling Stone, which, you know, nobody knew what the words meant, so it didn't matter. But when yeah. we did, I couldn't get high. That didn't go over well with the guidance counselor, so they stopped the performance and threw us off the stage. And we were blown away by a band called The Bats. And The Bats were not really from the school, but they were the hot group in the neighborhood. And it was a, 
it was mostly Puerto Rican guys. Orlando Vieira was the was the guitar player, and Carlos Avalaris was the drummer. And, and uh, there was a kid named Chris Wallace on guitar, and some other Puerto Rican. It was like mostly Puerto Rican musicians in the neighborhood. Whatever, nobody cared. It was just just kind of give you a little bit more of a background to yeah. it. And they blew us off the stage, so I wanted to join them. So they said, well. We need a bass player, and then Orlando will switch from bass to guitar. So I joined the Bats for a while, and and then uh, then the Bats kind of dissolved, or I left the Bats, and that began. You know, that was I got my first guitar. My I, I bought a bass, and then eventually, um, and then somewhere around '66, I got into the blues really heavily. Like That's when I was born, like blues like <laughs> yeah. heavily. It started with a Rolling Stones album, Rolling Stones Now. And then immediately, see, the Beatles were a rock and roll band. They were a cover band that became a rock and roll band. Of course. The Rolling Stones were a blues band from day one. Absolutely. Right. So there's a real difference there. And I don't want to get into I write rhythm a, and blues. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I write a Beatle column. I don't want to waste time in my, my proselytizing the differences, except grossly, the Beatles were a cover band, a, a pop cover band that became a rock and roll band that right. eventually became a rock band, but a rock and roll. But the Stones were definitely darker and, Way and, darker. and, and, and more mysterious, right? Yeah. And bluesy. So so when I heard Rolling Stones now, I, it excited me. Like the Beatles blew me away, but the Rolling Stones were like, ooh, maybe that's dangerous. Yeah. And immediately started reading interviews and they started talking about Muddy Waters and this and that. And I just said, wow, who are these guys? You know, who are these blues musicians? I, I, you know, first of all, I got into Chuck Berry because of Keith Richards. Because yeah. he was such a Chuck Berry fanatic. You know? totally. So I immediately went backwards to hear Chuck Berry, decided that guitar playing was great. And then uh, I heard a, an album by a band called the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, Absolutely. which was a hot blues band. Yeah. So I bought the album, and there was a local band in the neighborhood that played those songs. And the guitar player, Nick Katzman, was a hot shot player who played a Telecaster, just like Mike Bloomfield. And finally, um, in 1967, uh, in the September 67, I was, I was just turned 15, hadn't gotten high yet and smoked it, my first joint and then started listening to Paul Butterfield Blues and I said, whoa, I got to sound like Mike Bloomfield. I need a guitar. So my parents had no money and... What did your parents do? What did your my, dad my, do? My father was a jewelry salesman. I oh, mean, yeah. he was middle class. My mother was a political consultant and worked for John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy and every major Democratic candidate in New York City. She was a campaign manager or a consultant for so they were deeply entrenched in politics left wing uber super left wing kind of socialist communist in the 40s and 50s and eventually democratic uh operatives and um i wanted this guitar badly and and someone said well you know pot is, you could buy weed for 15 dollars an ounce and I said, well, how many nickel bags do you get out of it? They said, you can get like six or seven. So I bought an ounce for 15 bucks, and I made seven nickel bags and got, you know, $35. Yeah. I went, wow. So I bought two more ounces, and I got like more money. Then I bought a quarter pound for like $60 and made more money. Then I bought a half a pound and made more money. And the next thing you know, within four months, I'm rolling in thousands of dollars. Yeah. Getting high along the way, having a great old time, and I buy a Fender Telecaster. You know, I go to 48th Street. And I go to Manny's music. Did you get a 60s? Like I a new one? This is 1967. Like, oh, so you got like a transitional logo? I can actually show you a 67 telly, which I have. Not the one I bought. But right. I went down to 48th Street and I walked into Manny's music. And uh, when Manny's was located by 6th Avenue, most people who know Manny's know the Manny's. That's the newer one, right. even though it's out of business. But this was the original one. Don't forget, my father worked around the corner, so I'm always walking down that street. So just the street looking was, in the window was thousands of music stores. Yeah. From one I remember, end, yeah, from like, one of, yeah, but you don't even know you don't, right. you're too young to know the whole street had right. music stores, not just stopping at the Court Theater. This went back all the way to Sixth Avenue. There was dozens of them. In fact, today where Fox, Fox TV, you know the hate, hated Fox TV. Yeah, their their um, plaza, where their plaza is on 48th Street. That's that location is where Manny's music was the yeah. original Manny's, and we have played that Fox. We played Fox twice, and the stage was built at the exact location of Manny's, which is wow. kind of ironic if you want to say if you could project fifty years later. That's crazy. Anyway, I walk into Manny's, I tell them, I want to buy a Telecaster. They say I got one hundred forty-seven fifty. And I said, I have 135 bucks. And Henry said, well, you're not buying the guitar. So I walk across the street to a place called Jimmy's. 
And I said, I want to buy a Telecaster. And Manny says they want 147. I got 135. The guy says, give me the 135 and get out. So I got my Tele. Wow. Just a blonde, uh, like There's a blonde, a Rosewood, you know, not Rosewood maple cap. Yeah, man, yeah, yeah, Rosewood neck. But who knew? I mean, we nobody. Yeah. We're like 15 yeah, years old. We're happy to have a guitar, right? What do you want? What, what do we, That's what a do, great guitar, What, what too. do we know? But right what now. do we know? You know, what do we know? Except that it turns out I'm not a Fender guy. Yeah. I'm really not. I'm a more, much more of a Gibson guy. But I didn't know that yet. So I bought the guitar. Then I started jamming in the neighborhood. And, and over the years, I just bought tons of guitar. You know, I was making a lot of money selling weed. I was ahead of my time. Were you afraid to sell weed? Was it like, uh, like, I mean, where were you getting it? Like some local dealer had a bunch of it? Oh, man. Um, It came from a lot of sources. Let's just say that I was smart enough to understand the levels of dealers. In other words, I I was smart enough to understand street, next level, next level. And then, of course... The major import. So I never dealt with these major guys. Right. I was dealt with the guy probably two layers below him. Then I was below him. And there was two or three layers below me. The reason why I kind of figured this out was because I never wanted to get busted. Right. And I always figured if I watched these different levels and I saw cops getting too close in any one of them, I would back off for a while so I wouldn't be busted. So it was a very smart move on my part. Right. But, you know, you were still... Here's the mathematics of it. The first kilo, that's 2.2 pounds. Right. right? Bought for 150 bucks. Wow. Now, was it uh, Mexican? It was Mexican. Weed? Brought in brought right. in from Los Angeles. Wow. In a suitcase. Yeah. Like, you in know, a there's suitcase. a song by Alan, uh, by, by, was it that song? Flying in from Los Angeles. Yeah. Bringing in a couple of keys. Just <laughs> like that. My friend's brother brought a couple of keys in from LA in a suitcase. And I remember picking it up in a shopping bag on West, a couple of blocks of my house. And I remember giving him the money and him giving me 2.2 you know, like a kilo of weed, and me thinking every cop in the neighborhood knew I was carrying oh, weed. Oh, there's was, nothing like that. My heart was like racing. Right? Anyway, I, anyway, the point was, I just wanted to buy guitars and have enough money to go to concerts and and uh, just get high. And I, I didn't have a dream of being super fly, big yeah. drug dealer. I just wanted to support my uh, my 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 musical junkie habit, which is. Be able to go to any concert I wanted to go to, buy any guitar and amp I wanted to, and and have plenty of extra cash floating around and and uh, and money, because my parents didn't have it to give me, and I was. Doing Are you that, doing it right out of this right house? Right out of this house. Wow. Yeah, yeah, which my mother, you know, it freaked them out. But then again, to be fair, she knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody. Every parent knew every every kid was a hippie druggie. Right. So whether my parents knew I was selling more weed than somebody else, I don't know because I didn't survey other parents. Right. But we were all in the same boat. We were all 16, 17, 18 year old kids, all wasted all the time, all getting high all the time, all going to the Fillmore East every weekend. You know, living in New York City, having the Fillmore where tickets were three dollars and four dollars yeah. and five bucks yeah. and seeing anybody you wanted to four times a weekend if you wanted to each show was three bucks and if you couldn't afford it you went to central park in the summer and you saw those same bands for a dollar wow we're, i'm talking zeppelin i'm yeah. talking hendrix you seen zeppelin i'm talking yeah many many times wow I, mean, I, was, I was front row their first show in new york wow in 69 six um january 28th 1969 was it at the i have the, I have, I have i have the fillmore booklet in my up there i can show it to you wow they at open the fire and butterfly Phil, fillmore east yeah so i didn't go to i didn't go to see them i was doing a drug deal that night wow i had five pounds of weed in a shopping bag and someone was supposed to meet me under the marquee of the fillmore right and i already seen i already saw iron butterflies i didn't really give a shit i didn't want to see i, I didn't want to hear in a god of again i didn't really care yeah i was just you know i was just 17 and stoned out of my mind i had like five pounds of weed in a shopping bag and i'm standing under the marquee and and the guy didn't show oh so no. some guy goes hey man front row seat five bucks iron butterfly i went you know what i'm Freaking freezing. I yeah. bought the ticket. You went in with the weed? Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. I went in. I, I said, how bad could it be? Yeah. I got five pounds of weed and packs of bamboo. I'll just fucking smoke because the, all the dealers would meet in the balcony at the Fillmore. Yeah. That's really where all the action happened. That's nuts. But I wasn't interested in particularly dealing. I just want to get out of the cold. and wa- So I go in, and there's a gospel group called Porter's Popular Preachers. I'll never forget it because Bill, um, Bill Graham, Graham put together a crazy shit. Yeah, my favorite. He's crazy, like he just used to mash up shows. Yeah. So we had a gospel group, and they did. If I had a hammer and all this gospel shit, which was cool, and then Zeppelin comes on, and like I've got five pounds of weed, and I'm just like rolling doobies and passing them back and forth, and the whole row, it's like it's like Chernobyl in the fucking front row, you yeah. Know? And Zeppelin is just, I mean, oh yeah, I mean that I era. Mean, 
I mean, look, they sucked after 75, but I saw them many times. Before Jimmy with the telly, the dragon telly on that telly era. Telly playing through Rickenbacker. Killing floor, Rick all that Rickenbacker shit. amplifiers. Wow. You ever see Rickenbacker amps? Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, They're crazy shape. shape. Yep. Crazy shape. And they're so, in that cage. Like, yes. you can tilt it. Yep. So they had... They had six Ricky back of ramps, three on Jimmy's side and three on Paul Jones. So Fuck. they go on, and then Iron Butterfly comes on. But but John Bonham's drum solo was unbelievable, and compared to that douchebag solo and I and and it got a Davida. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So anyway, John were, Bonham just turned seventy. It would have been seventy last week. Yeah, makes it's sense. Fucking wild. So, so that that was great. So Zeppelin. Who, who who do you think? was the best you ever saw at the Fillmore because my buddy went to the Almond Brothers there. I, I saw the Almond Brothers the night they opened for the Grateful Dead, the very first show they were ever played. And look, I've been at great shows. Yeah. I was at John Mayall's Turning Point show when he recorded that album. I was at Rock of Ages when band, the band recorded that album at, at Academy Music. I was at the Fillmore Tenth Row Center when Jimmy Hendrix recorded Band of Gypsies. You know, I've been there. I was there in all these shows, wow. and so I've seen them all. Band I of Gypsies, the, New Year's Eve. Yeah, yeah. Been Madison there, yeah, Square Garden. Oh well, no, Band of Gypsies, New Year's Eve, Fillmore East. Oh, but, it was uh, Fillmore East. Yeah, yeah got it. Um, uh, so I, you know, I, I had the benefit of seeing some amazing things, and I saw, you know, I saw the Allman Brothers open for the Dead. I was a Deadhead. Oh God, which is weird. I'm such a Deadhead. Yeah, now. but I saw the Dead with Pigpen 26 times. Wow, are you still into the Dead? No, no. The story goes that, and I talk about this in the um, in the documentary. Right. I saw the Dead 27 times. 26, no, 26 times. 25 times on acid. Greatest band I ever saw. 26 times straight, and I walked out and said, that's the worst shit I ever <laughs> heard in my life. And, and from the 26th time I saw them with, at Roosevelt Stadium, which was in October of 72, I never listened to The Dead again from that day really? on. Really? And I was a four-year committed deadhead. Every album, all the time, 24-7, 25 shows. Jerry Garcia gave me a tab of acid at the Fillmore East. It doesn't get any crazier than this. Totally 100% immersed. But... Because you will appreciate this. Yeah. The drummer of the Grateful Dead is Bill Kreutzman, one of the yep. two drummers. I get an email from this guy, Justin Kreutzman, about two months ago. And it says, I want Justin Kreutzman. I couldn't. And he goes, hey, JJ, I think you know my dad's band, the Grateful Dead. This yeah. is Justin Kreutzman. I just saw the documentary. I just saw what you said about my dad's band. That's the funniest shit I ever heard in my life. <laughs> We've become friends. Yo, great. Now we're good friends on email. Yeah. We've never met yet, but he seems like a very funny guy. I like him a lot. We should go see him at City Field you know, next week. He saw, well, <laughs> he, he, the thing is, I haven't seen him, and I, yeah, I, I don't probably don't I understand. Want him. But I understand. anyway, I met Bob Weir, by the way, yeah. about three months ago. Well, where at? And well, I was at a music store called D'Angelico. I was at the showroom. He was there. He, oh yeah, he plays those. He couldn't have been nicer. That guy's cool. I said to him, you know, I saw Twisted Sister. I saw The Grateful Dead more than any other band. I saw you guys twenty. I didn't tell him. I yeah, I yeah of course. Him. I just said, by the way, I was I saw twenty five shows with Pigpen, and I said, I just want you to know, you guys. And what they did was they they, they um, validated my lust for rock and roll, and they did. They were certainly part of that incredible mosaic of bands I was able to see from 1969 to 1972 when effectively Twisted started and then then I took over being my own show because right. I really was working all the time. Yeah. So, But from 69 to 72, I saw anybody and everybody you could possibly imagine and I had an amazing time. You know, I saw The Who the whole week at the Fillmore, the Crosby, Stills and Nash the week at the Fillmore. I saw Neil Young with and without Crazy Horse. I mean, I seen you know, Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart, the Jeff Beck group. Faces? Every, oh yeah, many, many, yeah. many times. Yeah, I, I saw Rod Stewart in many situations. I saw Beck, I saw Beck with Stewart, I saw Beck as a solo, I saw Beck with, um, with, uh, with uh, Beck, you know, uh, Af with Beck Ola, with, yeah, I've seen, I've seen and Clapton and Cream as an opening band. I saw Cream and The Who open for the Young Rascals and Wilson Pickett yeah. in 1967. I saw The Animals in Central Park with the original lineup in 66. I've been very blessed. I've seen, yeah, I saw Elvis and Sinatra and I've seen, I've seen thousands of great artists, which is why I have a very low tolerance for bands. You I know? think I'm the same way. I started in 77 and, and, and went from there and saw thousands of shows. And I do feel the same way you do. When I go to shows now, I kind of, uh, I'm like, I don't really need to be here. You know what I mean? Like I, now I don't see any bands anymore. If I've seen them more than a few times, I'm like, nah. 
You know, I'll go see a new band just to, to check some stuff out. You know, there's a lot of great new stuff. But, man, like, you know, I, I just went and saw Judas Priest for, like, my 20th time. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't really need to see this again, you know. Um, and they're a great band. They're great. They're great. They're great. But they're I'm wonderful. Just, but, I'm, but the question is, do you have other things to do that night? Yeah. Now? That's yeah. the question. I just like, want to do comedy. Does rock make, make me go crazy? And the fact is, at this point in my life, I like doing motivational speaking. Yeah. I like writing. You know, I just wrote an article for Inc. Magazine, which which is my which is a business column for ink. I just wrote about I, I wrote a, a column called Wash, Rinse, Repeat. And the column is about repetition and what you have to do to become great. Yeah. And this is the premise of the article. This is how my life is. 20-year-old musician comes up to me. Hey man, hey man, I'd love you to come see my band. I go, oh, cool. How many shows? How long have you been together? They go, oh man, two years. I go, oh, cool. How many shows have you done? Oh, like we've done 50. I said, Oh, really? How long are your shows? Oh, you know, anywhere from like, you know, 30 to 50 minutes. I said, oh, 50 shows in two years. I said, cool. I said, 50 shows? He goes, yeah. I said, do me a favor. I said, let me know when you hit 500. Yeah. 500 shows? That'll never happen. I said, well, guess what? Looks like I ain't going to be coming to your band. Yeah. Why do I say that? Because in the first two years that Twisted Sister played, in the first two years, 1973 and 74, we played 396 evenings. Yeah, let we me played 1,948 performances. Do you understand? Yeah, that's in the first two years. Yeah, and, I've done 4,000 stand-up shows in okay. the last eight years. Four, okay. oh, almost 4,000. Well, what did you learn a hell? Of, okay, but when the band, with a company, you learn an awful lot when totally. you can do that with that kind of consistency, and you have to do it with that kind of consistency you do. because. Every night that you screw up and you learn what to do the next night, you, you fix it, you go back the next day. Um, that's amazing that you've done that. Yeah. I'm and, sure. And I, and, I, and I put them all in my phone mm -hmm. because I want to know exactly where I'm at. And it's like, you know, so every day. So here it is this year. Uh, we're on, I don't know, June 5th. I've done 184. I love it. So I, I can show you diaries in my band. Yeah. You'll see. You'll see. That we did... Uh, thousands. Of well, one, one thing thousands. that I really, really knocked me out, and I'm not sitting here like going, oh, yeah, well, I did this. But, but what, I, what knocked me out on the documentary was the way that it constantly, you, you were told no, and you kept going. Because when I started comedy, uh, I was 44, and I was just told no. It's not going to happen. And then 45 goes around. They go, hey, you're just too old. 46, yeah, you're going to go away. 47, now I'm 52. And, you know, that song, Stay Hungry, hits me all the time because I watched you guys. And I told my buddy, I told my buddy, I go, you got to watch this because they never fucking gave up, you know? And that is so so rare in the world especially now in the digital age of like oh i didn't happen i'm just moving on to this you know i mean that fucking blew me away i never even knew the history of no 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 and then even when yes bad shit happens like heart attacks and all that shit i'm just like what <laughs> or or your bass player you're about to showcase the biggest show ever in new york palladium and my, and my guitar player collapsed yeah guitar yeah yeah it's just crazy shit you know yeah, yeah. And when I look at that, I look at that as like drive and, and perseverance and we're not, no, fucking, we don't care. This is what we do if you're coming here or not coming on board. But we did have one thing that a lot of people don't have the luxury of having. And I'll say this because while, yes, from a purely statistical analysis, it looks like you never say no and you keep persevering no matter what. But I will say this, and this is an important component. The band was an extremely financially successful bar band. Totally. So what, meant, what that meant was that if I got a rejection in the afternoon from a label, I could go play that night in front of 2,000 screaming fans and at least lick my wounds and know that I'm not crazy. In other words, if I didn't have the validation of the fans... Those rejections would have added up to the point where you go, maybe we shouldn't. But You're you know so what? right. We had the ability to play five nights a week to mostly packed rooms, anywhere from 800 people to 5,000 people, especially during the period of time that we were shopping the band. So you know what? Um, now, even that became old after a while. But when you were making as much money as we were making, A, we weren't starving. 
So that's a very big thing. Not only we weren't starving, we had a five-man crew, we had health insurance, we had a truck, we had all the gear in the world, right? We put on professional shows every night. So when we would get rejected, we'd go, how can we suck this? 3,000 people out here tonight. There's yeah. 4,000 people out here tonight. There's 5,000 people out here tonight. There's 20,000 people at Adventureland. You know, people said to me when you made it, you know, you guys so seamlessly went on. I said, what? Because we were an 18-month pregnant woman. Yeah. Like we'd been given, we gave, we should have been given birth years ago. But, but, and here's a big thing for you. So when people say to me, aren't you angry it took so long? I've revised my response to that. You want to know my response now? What is it? We made it when it was right time to make it. Oh, man. Yeah. Because we weren't ready yet. Right. The timing wasn't ready yet. It just so happened we outlasted the negativity long enough to take advantage of the timing when it worked. And that's really the key. And for that, there's luck involved. I'd like to tell you it was genius. It was genius that I kept it together and that I had a business model that worked and that the guys... And all, I give them all the credit, and D. Mark and Eddie especially, they trusted me and D to keep pushing, even when it looked like we couldn't push anymore. Right. But without that final break that did it, it nothing would have happened, right? So I kind of look at it as um, we kept on being stuck on an iceberg, and the helicopters would come down to rescue us, and, and the iceberg would melt, and then we'd just get plucked up just enough, but it wasn't enough yet, and it wasn't enough yet, and it wasn't finally... It was plucked up, and we finally did the Atlantic deal, and it worked. But it was because the band was so successful. However, the drinking age was changing, and we knew that was coming to an end anyway. Wow. That, I whole, never thought about that. the whole that. thing was going to collapse. See, I knew this. I knew starting in 1981, the, the New York State Legislature started raising the drinking age, and I went, wait a minute. If our livelihood is based on the fact that you can 18, meaning 15-year-old kids, were getting in, right. to be honest, there was a huge pool of, of kids. And they kept moving it up. I said, you know, in three years, when the drinking age hits 21, we're going to lose the ability to draw at least 40% of the people. So we felt a pressure of having to escape this before it came crashing down. So <laughs> that was the drama. It was outrunning the law in yeah. a way because I knew that the available pool of fans was going to disappear. But, but to be honest about it, we never starved Ever. Oh yeah, I, well that's the thing I I I absolutely forget about because yeah I think one thing that uh, people tap out I always say nothing will make an artist tap out quicker than a thirty thousand dollar a year job that they get you know like well I'm just gonna work over here at Kinkos during the day and then they make them a manager and then they're they're just out because they've never made any money so you were making money so yeah you're playing rock. And you're making money. So it is, in like a way, you're playing bigger crowds than a lot of concert bands. bands. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the problem with that, I'm having this back and forth with a guy who wants to do some an interview with me about the Long Island club scene, about the art form of the Long Island club scene and how great the Long Island club scene was. And I said, man, you really are missing the boat. The Long Island club scene was not art and it wasn't great. And he said, what do you mean? I said, because if you look at all the scenes, like the real scenes that created great artists, like Liverpool, yeah. You had a thousand bands come out of Liverpool. Yeah. San Francisco, yeah. right? LA in the 60s, Seattle. LA in the 80s, Seattle. You're talking about periods of time in a single location in which original music was fostered and, and accepted, right? And they became hotbeds of creativity. Long Island was the exact opposite. All covers. We paid you to be a great cover band, yep. and God forbid you should do originals, because yeah. if you do originals, you're going to be out on your ass. So what our scene did was, it forced you to not be original. So, it, so, the, so what happened was, all these really great musicians, and there were tons of great musicians there, we're faced with, do I want to try originals where I can't, get, I, I can't make money, or I'm going to be making a shitload of money playing covers, um, but I can't really do originals. They took the cover bait. Yeah, yep, yeah. And so what, so what happened was the Long Island Tri-State bar scene um, was not only non-artistic, but it actually stifled creativity. So the fact that we came out of a scene that stifled creativity yep. is probably a greater story because we figured out a way to be original without losing our popularity. And it was really stealth. You know what I mean? Like we would yeah. do a new song. We wouldn't announce it was ours. We would get people used to hearing it. Then we do another song. We would not announce it was ours. And then, you know, before, you know, after a while, it was 50% of our own originals. And since the club owners never saw a drop off, they didn't care. Yeah. These guys are all like members of the Sopranos. Like, hey, what's going yeah. on? We got Twisted Sister this These weekend. How are 
many guys. people? Right? These fucking guys. How many people they draw this weekend at Detroit? Yeah, they drew, you know, they filled the place up both nights. 1,200 people a night. How many people played Speaks? You know, they filled it up every night. 1,800 people. The club owner didn't give a shit what yeah. you played. He just wanted the room packed. He didn't care. After a while, they didn't care. We were smart enough to be entertaining enough so that we could stealthily in, inflict our songs until Shoot Him Down was recorded as a demo. Then we used it as a commercial. We used to buy commercial spots on the radio. I remember that on the spots a weekend. Yeah. And we used to play Shoot Him Down in the spot with a tag in the first five seconds and the last five seconds. So if you're a casual listener on PLJ, you heard Shoot Him Down a hundred fucking times in a weekend and you started to think, that's a hit song on WPLJ. Next thing you know, we could play it. People started reacting. It was like one of the most creative marketing plans anybody could have ever used. We were buying radio time, essentially, was what it was yep. uh, before anybody caught us at it and said, you know, you really can't be doing that because that's giving people are thinking it's this. Well, too late, motherfucker. We've got these songs <laughs> up. So, again, it was really smart, manipulative, um, a, a smart, manipulative technique in, in, this, in a scene that otherwise was not encouraging uh, to originality. As I look at the documentary, I think it's one of the great documentaries you know it's just such i think it's such a um a, a thing of like uh you know it gives gives people hope in life and something that you know that you believed in it and you kept going you know but it is it's brutal some of the cards you guys got you know played i mean it's almost like yeah, I mean, it is Spinal Tap, you know? I it, mean, when the, this yeah. guy signs a record deal, then he gets on the plane and ha dies of a heart attack. Yeah, attack. Well, You're you know, A&R guy. But think, about th but think about this. In the earliest days when, when the original singer pulled a gun out on the drummer, you know, in a cataclysmic bar, bar fight, I yeah. thought my life was over then. Yeah. I mean, I really thought I walked in on that scene. I was 22 years old. Talk about traumatized. I thought that was the end of my career. I mean, there was, there was about 10 times I said, my career is over. There's about 10 instances that occurred during the course of the, the 10 years that I really said, holy shit, like my career is over. Like, oh shit, how are we getting out of this one? Like, oh my God, how, you know, I'm not a religious guy. I'm, I'm an atheist. You know, I basically go, how the, here's what I say to myself. Oh shit, how the hell am I getting out of this one? You yeah. Know? Uh, I'm not a religious guy because I don't believe in giving credit when something good happens to somebody else and taking the blame. That's typical Catholicism. Like, you know, everything bad I do is my fault and everything good I'm giving it, I'm giving credit to Jesus. <laughs> I say, pick one or the other. Yeah. Either give him all the credit and all the blame or keep all the credit and all the blame. I'm too narcissistic to give away, you know, all the credit. So I'm going, it's my fault for fucking up and it'll be my victory for winning. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Right? I will beat myself up when I do something bad and I will kiss my ass and, and with a big smile yeah. when I do something good. So we always figured out a way. And I have to say, D, you know, yeah, he's a lead singer and all the shit that goes to the lead singers, but professional, committed, dedicated. Yeah. That's him. Talented. I forget. We don't even touch the talented part because he's talented. Yeah. Great singer, great songwriter. But that was to come. I mean, he was a great singer at the beginning. But he just was like, we push. We push. We forge ahead. We forge ahead. And then Eddie, you know, and Mark. Mark right there. Forge ahead. And those who can't get left behind. And we left behind a lot of guys. Yeah, yeah. And that was another thing, too. Um, I played music for years. And there's nothing more disheartening as a new band member all the time. You know, it really takes the wind out of the sails. Yeah, but you know? nothing is worse than a guy that doesn't go with the program and you got to get rid of him. Oh, Come no. On. No, 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 no that's the worst. That's the worst. That's the worst. Getting rid of the guy uh, and having the guy not understand why he wasn't working, okay? Yeah. And like somehow trying to defend his stupidity. I, I lost, you know, I, I kind of, after a while, I said, I'm not interested anymore. I've given you every chance. I've given you a warning. I told you how we operate. We don't fuck around. This isn't, this isn't sex, drugs, and rock and roll. This is business, business, and rock and roll. That's all it is. Yeah. It's business. You can't keep up. You're gone. So, you know, when someone said, wow, you were hard on this guy, hard on this guy. No, I wasn't. I said, hey, man, you got a problem? I'm there with you. You're like, you have a problem? Okay, I got it. Can I help you? Can I? But after a while, if you're putting my career in danger, then you're gone. Yeah. Because I don't have time to worry about your shit. I just don't. And so therefore, screw somebody else's life up. Not going to screw my life. I mean, Kenny, the bass player who was in our documentary, I love Kenny. Kenny was the best pure musician ever. And Kenny needed to leave because Kenny had an alcohol problem, which he 
talks openly about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It. And, you know, the worst place an alcoholic should work is in a bar. I didn't want Kenny to go. I did everything I could to keep Kenny there because I loved Kenny. And I couldn't. And then it became apparent to me, this is no place for him to be. He needs to save his life. Yeah. So Kenny is one of the ex-guys who the band members all love because, you know, he needed to make a decision to save his life, you know. But the other guys... You know, we tell them, yeah, by the way, we don't drink and get high. They don't really believe it. You know, they don't really. I think they think we're kidding around. Yeah. Or I think they think, oh, well, yeah, they won't notice it. Oh, yes, we do. No, oh, you notice it right away. Four or five nights a week, and you got to rehearse on that sixth day. Yeah, and, and you're you got to be up and you got to be fucker. there on time. You got a schedule to maintain. You, we, yeah, and you're, now you're dragging tonight. You, you're, you're forgetting this or whatever. We're going to beat you up for it, you know, like mentally. Yeah. That's what happens. It's, 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 uh, there's nothing like I'm a comedian now and, and the freedom I feel every, cause my work ethic is so fucking radical. It's seven days a week, nonstop podcast all during the day, then comedy at night, then audition, write jokes at book flights, you know, travel, everything. Uh, now that I don't have any, uh, baggage on me, it's crazy. People go, man, you got somewhere pretty quick in eight years. I'm like, I would have been here in rock and roll if I had four of me. Four of me, I would have been fucking multi-platinum. You know what I mean? Because as soon as you got a couple guys, you're like, fuck, we can't find another guitar player right now. We just got to keep them in. And then you just, oh, man, it's all. And then it becomes anger. Yeah. And then you hate the guy when you shouldn't hate the guy. You're just, but you're like, fuck this guy and his girlfriend, and they're watching TV. They got to no, watch. But on the other, let me just say this, though. I get what you're saying. Right now in my life, I like being a motivational speaker and writing. You know why? Because it's just me. Yeah. So I don't have to talk to my partners anymore. To be clear, in the context of Twisted Sister, I have to talk to these guys because I need their input and all the stuff, and that's fine. But I'm now done with that for other projects. Now, any project, I'm going to be running it. Completely myself. But for Twisted, I understood the power of the partnership. Of course. Very, very important to have it. Um, because you ever wonder why some musicians um, choose to be solo plus band like Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Bruce Springsteen and East Street Band versus a band? It, it's, I was managing two artists in the last couple of years, one of whom, I, both of them are, were great, but they had those two very distinct philosophies. One wanted to be a member of an equal partnership with the band and one wanted to be the leader. So when I asked the one who wanted to be the equal partner why, she said, because I wanted all of us to sacrifice together and win together because I knew if everybody had skin in the game, then they'd all pull together. And that's one philosophy. Yep. The other philosophy is I want people to do what I want, when I want, but the downside is I have to pay for all that up front yeah. because since they're not sharing in the spoils, all they do is get paid on the day you play. Yep. So you have to be willing to make that sacrifice. So those kinds of people that run bands like that, where it's me plus so-and-so, those guys, you know, they get the accolades themselves, uh, and, they can, and they hire, fire, don't have to answer to anything. Yeah. But the downside is you don't have the connectivity of a partnership. So yeah, it's just yeah. too full. You know, not, also not, a not, downside not is, of that is constantly losing guys to, uh, uh oh, Lenny Kravitz needs dudes and oh, yeah. he saw you. Uh oh, such and such needs you. And right. then they cherry picking the A guys and then the B guys and then all of a sudden you're down on the C guys. Yeah, that can happen too. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. But it can also happen in a partnership too. But well, I always love the gang feeling of a band. Yeah. I always loved that. It was always a dream of mine. It was always like, we're ACDC, we're Van Halen, you know what I mean? We're, we're Twisted Sister, whatever. We're out there. We're guys, and we're going to make it. And, uh, and then when you got the one guy that's just like, you know, not pulling his weight, you know, say the drummer or whatever is not around while you're writing the tunes late night, four nights in a row, and then just shows up and goes, where's my cut? Then it gets rough. There's not a cut of anything, but what I'm saying later down the road. I understand that in Nashville, the way that Nashville songwriters write may be the most democratic way going because people have explained to me that when Nashville songwriters write, there'll be like four or five in a room. And if two guys come up with a song, they split the money evenly. In other words, if you happen to be out that day and not the other right, other guys do, they do. That's a certain philosophy. You know, it's a philosophy of how they share. Right. Not every band shares the same way either. Even if it's a, even if it's a partnership, they don't share the same way. So it can get complicated and it gets technical. And Twisted has had its 
technical issues um, that way, just like any other band. I Did mean, it look, come because and, of the Stay Hungry record? No, just but look at this. Look at Van Halen. Van Halen really isn't a band. Van Halen's Eddie, whatever the whatever Eddie Van Halen says is really how how it real. That's really how it is. I mean, let's the ACDC. It's really how Angus and his brother. One hundred percent. You know, it's how Angus and Malcolm felt plus a uh, George. Uh, you know, their manager yeah, producer. Yep. It's everybody else was you know just happy to be along for the ride. As much as it was a band, that's all it is. Boston was always Tom Scholz. Yep. I don't care. So, you know, rock and roll sells this pretend image a lot of ways that it's a family and it's bullshit. And that's the thing that rock and roll sells. We sell this theory that it's a love yeah. fest. Meanwhile, in any other business, you, no one expects the CEO to go home with his, with his CFO. No one expects that, uh, that, that the, the, the senior vice president hangs out with the other senior vice president. They don't. But in rock and roll, yeah. we sell this idea yeah. that it's we are family and yeah. it's best known when it's not. So when It's those funny when you're backstage later on in life too and you're like, well, hey, where's the other guys? Uh, I don't know. I haven't talked to that guy in two years. I mean, First time I played for, with ZZ Top at a festival, Yeah, they showed up separately. They walked on stage separately. They walked off. I said, to the promoter, what's up with that? He goes, oh, that's what they do. Yeah. They have their own friends. They come in, they walk on stage, they walk off, they goodbye. Yes, it was um, Chris Squire and um, Rick Wakeman came in together and they don't talk to John Anderson and they didn't talk to, um, um, what was it? It was, it was John Anderson and Steve Howe. Yeah. They called them the Fairy Dust Twins or some shit like that. Like They were, so, <laughs> they were in totally separate sections. Right. Of the, I was even stunned. Yeah, I was buying into the fact that oh, don't you all arrive together and play together? Yeah. No, but then you learn. You know, you've been together forty years. You come up with a formula, just like a marriage. Yeah, whatever it takes. It's a business. It's a business. And you know what? If the if the bottom line is that you all get on the stage at the right time, you all know your parts and you play your parts, then fuck it. That's what you're supposed to do. You're entertainers, and the rest of it is in the mind of the fans' theory of what they think is behind. It's it. like a Broadway play. They don't all go home yeah, together. Exactly. The they thing. show up on stage, they put on a great show, and they go home. And that's all the way. It's the way it should be. But we have this other, you know, crazy view of how we want to sell the family absolutely i you know it's funny when you think about the um i watched the documentary and the insanity of how stay hungry the record was wrote um because before you were writing all the stuff no 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 i didn't write oh you didn't no, write? no 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 i was very clear i let me i'll be really clear i never i'm not a writer i write some songs but they were never a Twisted Sister type material. They were more like uh, Lou Reedish, Ve Velvet Underground. If I was going to do a solo record, right? It wasn't what the band evolved in. I, and I'm not a singer. I always, I knew from almost the first month of joining Twisted Sister as the the last original member of a whole bunch of different guys that I need to latch on to very talented people. But I can push the business side of it. I can bring organizational t tools to it. But I'm not the creative guy. I mean, I'm way more creative now because the band pretty much leaves it to me to create the packages, the repackages, the titling of these packages, the concept of videos. It's all left to me now. Dee's off doing his solo thing. And Mark is out. Eddie's out. You know, AJ's obviously departed. Who was writing the stuff before? But D was, D was writing the stuff. And, before and now, Stay Hungry, though. Well, D. And, and there was an issue between Mark and Eddie, I think. Not me. I never cared who wrote. Seriously, I didn't write. So yeah. it's not like someone said to me, your songs aren't on this record. I didn't write, so I didn't care. Did I'm, you guys split it? Uh, D did not. He kept his publishing. Wow. Himself. He kept his publishing the whole time. He even knew to do that back then, huh? Yeah. You know, I guess his manager told him or somebody told him. Well, actually, he, he shared it with me for quite a long time. Um, because he acknowledged that my organizational skills brought something else to the table. So he gave me a part of it. So I, I did benefit by it for a long time. Wow. So now when the records are sold, you're getting nothing. Well, I manage everything. Oh, you manage everything. So, so I get, oh, I get a go. piece of everything. Wow. <laughs> but the other guys. Well, uh, here's how it works. Yeah. He's the songwriter. He gets his piece. Gotcha. Mark is the producer. He gets his piece. Wow. I'm the manager. I get my piece. I guess... Eddie is not any of those three things. Right. And AJ is not either. So they get their shares of everything minus that. So Mark gets his production. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I mean, look at the Beatles and look at what they did. I, I believe 
you know, George Harrison was restricted to two songs an album, which didn't make him very happy. I believe that Ringo gets a piece of it. They just give, they uh, volunteer a certain small percentage to Ringo, which a small percentage of what they make is yeah. more than eight billion times more than the average person yeah, would yeah, ever yeah. see in his lifetime, so it doesn't really matter. But they all share in all the revenues of the general Beatle business, and we all share in the general revenues of all the Twisted business because there's huge revenues we make a lot licensing our music right now we're the number one licensed band in the world at this is point. that right yeah for oh, music for music wow for, we're not going to take in i want to rock and the most licensed songs in the history of metal holy shit more tv shows more commercials more movie soundtracks than any other two songs in the history of of 80 of of all 80s music yeah. that's unbelievable yeah, like in the last three months kfc canada um mitsubishi america um Ready Player One, the Spielberg movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Major. Walmart in Mexico. Um, Young Sheldon, the TV show, used two songs. I mean, this happens every month. It just, it's massive, the amount of... And who's um, filtering that stuff, you or as a publisher? Well, the ugly truth about music publishing yeah. is that, let's say all the top five companies control two million songs, three million yep. songs. How many songs do you think they actually care about in their catalog? Probably a thousand or something, a hundred. Maybe a hundred. Right. Maybe. So they bust their ass working on that hundred. Why? Because it's easy. Yeah. Because they know. Well, we're not going to take an I Want a Rocker, just two of those songs. Like, Don't Stop Believing. Wow. Like, don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Like, these songs are there. Yeah. And they're so there that when you're an ad agency in Madison Avenue, and you go, hey, we need a song. Yeah. What do you got? I don't know. How about Don't Stop Believing? You find out how much that'll cost. What about We're Not Gonna Take It? Yeah, yeah, find out how much that's gonna cost. Why does every drug company use I Feel Good by James Brown? There's wow. a million songs with doctors. Doctor, doctor, give yeah. me the new nothing. Yeah. It's always, what do you got? They got new Favlina Blair. Yeah. What do you use? Yeah. How about I Feel Good by James Brown? Just get some overweight black they, guy. They should channel. throw you like, a fella bone. Doctor, doctor, please. Yeah, but you know? they don't. I know. They're fucking lazy and I'm thrilled. Yeah, I know, I right? Couldn't be happier. Oh my god! Stay lazy. Yeah, stay, 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 stay lazy. lazy. Yeah, for, stay my, for my income. Yeah, stay, stay lazy. lazy for my bank. Oh. Stay lazy for my income. <laughs> I've got you to thank. I mean, that's really what it is. I want to rock, and we're not going to hear just there, and they're easy, and yeah. everybody knows. Why do you listen? Even if. Every teachers group that went on strike this year saying we're not going to take it at their rallies. It is the probably the greatest folk so, protest song since um, like Dylan. I, I don't know. So I mean, yes, it's blown in the wind since we shall overcome. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I, this is not a pretentious statement. I no, think no. it is the biggest worldwide accepted protest song right now and as a benefit of it, it's in the air everywhere and it's non-denominational, meaning it can fit. The left, it can fit the right. Yeah. It can fit every disenfranchised group in the world, you know. And D wrote that song. I give him all the credit in the world, you know. He yeah. wrote that song. And and we benefit by it because we, we recorded the master and we we sell our master, which we control 100%. You own the masters now? We own the re-record and oh. we, we, we push the re-record. Because it sounds exact, you know, it sounds exactly like the original. Except we own it, so you're like the first guy besides Def Leppard that I've talked to that's done a re-record. When you went in, we uh, went in before anybody. I, I believe. Okay, I get, did, I get that, but did. I wanted to ask you this, and I always wondered: yeah. Did you really re-record, or do you just go, "Yeah, here it is"? No, completely. Because I was thinking you could just jack your own recording nah, and say you. Re I, would, I wouldn't want to do that and, and face legal issues. Right. I'm just saying, how would they know? Um, because you listen to them and they're, uh, they're, uh, I got it's, they're different. Yeah. And, and well, first of all, they sound better because they're more recently recorded. So the techno technology and the production. Are How long better. ago did you re-record, uh, 2005, stay hungry? 2005, because still hungry was re recorded in 2005. Because the record company still owns your masters for what? 30 years. They still own them. I mean, we can try to get them back now, but they own them, you know, for like 50 years, I think. 50? I thought yeah. it was 30. No, it's 35. It's 35, I believe. Right. So technically, I think we may be able to go after it, but I have a great relationship with Warner Music right now. They're re-releasing all of our product. I'm really happy all the stuff is coming out of vinyl. But um, we have a, a really good... Listen, they made a shitload of money off Stay Hungry. They made a shitload of money off of We're Not Gonna Take It. Still, when it comes to downloads, that's the song you download. Totally. Because when you go to download a song, 
you usually look at the number that is, is downloaded and you go, I want the one with like the 8 million downloads, yep. not the one with the 300,000 downloads because yeah. the 8 million must be the one. Yeah. That's the... Atlanta. They're not grabbing SMF, they're and they, grabbing... <laughs> well, no, not just that. They're going to they're gonna grab the one that's been done I, the most because they think that's the most authentic. That's just what you do instinctively when you look and go, oh, I need to, I want that greatest hit song. And you, let's say you want to do Stand By Me, Benny King, and you go online, you see there's eight versions of, of Stand By Me live, blah, 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 and you see one that's got like... 30 million downloads and one's got 6 million. You're going to go for the 30 million one thinking that's got to be the original yeah. one. But we take advantage of the fact that our stuff is in commercials. So the re-record is, uh, where, where'd you guys do it at? Studio in Long Island. And you guys went in there and just re-record? No, the thing is we recorded the entire, we recorded Stay Hungry. Completely. I didn't know because I have it on vinyl. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't pay attention to that. Still, it's Still Hungry. It's, just, it's, it's called Still Hungry, which is Stay Hungry, but re-recorded. Right. With additional eight more songs on the album. And what were the songs from? Uh, like tracks that, that didn't no, make Still it Hungry on? No, Still Hungry is Stay Hungry, completely re-recorded. It's the no, whole album. But I'm saying you said additional... Oh, plus eight songs. No, right. these are eight songs that we recorded in the studio. Just newer ones? No, stuff we've been sitting around that we never finished. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. I, uh, I was hosting, co-hosting uh, the Cat House thing with Ricky, um, and you guys played technically the last gig ever. Uh, in LA, I, I think you played another gig as Twisted Sister. We System. did. We played one final gig in Mexico. In Mexico, yeah, because that gig in LA was like mid October 2016, right. and then we played a November 16th show or 15th or 16th with Kiss in Mexico, and that was it. Well, my point was, I, I've seen Twisted Sister many times, um, but at this time, I was was on the stage. I was on your side, and. Uh, and I had never been that close to D and, and the band, you know, playing. And I was like fucking floored. It was like a hammer at, at your guys' age, especially D. His vocals were blowing my mind. I mean, I still were telling, I was telling people about it for like six months. I was like, you don't understand. I have a, a video of it. I, I took a video and it was more powerful than any band I had seen in years that were even new bands. I couldn't believe what was coming off the stage energy-wise. It was crazy. I, I, I just can't believe that that doesn't still go on, you know? Well, it's the only way we know how to do what we do. Yeah. So, and someone says to me, wow, you guys are this or that. I said, that's what we do. We can't be anything other than a, a powerhouse. I'm proud that we were as good if not better at our last show than we were at our first show because so many bands suck yeah and when people say to me you know um how do you blow these bands away i said we don't consciously go out to blow a band away we go out to put on the best show we can and if a band can't do it then it's their problem it's not my problem i don't sit there and tell them how to be a band but since we have headlined every major band you could possibly name, and I won't name any of them so, so their fans don't get upset. But we've taken almost every one of them out and embarrassed them. <laughs> and, and we love that because it's a predatory view of how Twisted Sister functions as a live act. You know, we, we go out to blow other bands away. We've been doing it ever since the bars. So that's just how we do it. It's not that I don't like these guys. It's not like personally i don't like them i just go out there to demolish another band i want to destroy i want to completely demoralize them that's what i want to do now if they're watching us they're demoralized if they're in their dressing room they don't know how much we've destroyed them but we've sucked all the oxygen out of the room so we leave nothing for them which is what happens a lot of times these bands who know it go let twisted close because because going on after them is a waste of time it happens more often than you can imagine where the headliner just gives up and just says, come up with an excuse why we can't close. Oh, well, we have to go tomorrow morning to another show and we can't make it. Oh, fine. But I don't care because I'll come on earlier because I, I don't want to be up at three in the morning either. You know? Yeah. Um, so we'll come on earlier, but we do suck all the oxygen out of the room and we leave nothing for other bands. And, and, and um, we enjoy the hunt. Yeah. I tr truly enjoy the hunt. But I also have to tell you that if we got blown off the stage, I'd say, okay, so big deal. You got, you're, you're better than us that day. Fine. You know who benefits? The audience. Yeah. Because the audience saw a great show. I, I care as an entertainer that the audience walks out and says, I spent X for the night. I saw eight bands. Five of them were amazing. I want that to happen. The fact that that never happens because I've never seen a band come within 20 feet of our performance is not so much 
me wanting to crow about it as much as I feel bad for the fans who didn't get what I thought they should get. And the cliche performance levels of most of these bands, because face it, we've done 9,000 shows. And we don't 9,000? I've done 9,000 performances. Wow. Twisted Sister. Yeah. 9,000? Performances, yeah. It, even? Over, no, uh, 9,200, somewhere around there. I have wow. Around so A, I'm cocky about what I know. Yeah, yeah. And B, and I have high expectations. And, um, but for the life of me, I have to tell you that I sit there sometimes and watch these other headliners and go, do they really think that that's good or do they really think that that's right or do they really pick the right songs? Do they really understand how to play? Look, there's an art form to playing in front of eighty to 100,000 people. Not that many bands can do it. What is the art form? Do, when you're looking at it, a set list and stuff, do you just plot out, like, is it a slow build? Is it come out, kill, and then no. take it for a yeah, ride? Well, yes, it is. It's an arc of a performance. And right. We specialize in the arc, and we've done it for 45 years, right? So we understand the arc of a performance. And most bands, I don't care how many years they've been together, don't truly get the arc of a performance. They let too much... They make they make critical mistakes during their set for the most part that I've watched, and they let the audience go. We never let them. We never let them off the hook. What do you think um, the critical mistake? Too many new songs. Oh, that's one big one. Right. The biggest mistake you can make is play any new songs. As far as I'm concerned, <laughs> the dumbest shit on the planet is to play a new song. I mean, the dumbest, fucking dumbest. In fact, I laugh and I go, "Please play your new album." Yeah, because everyone will be falling to fucking sleep. I guarantee you. <laughs> so there's two. Unless guys. it's Stay Hungry, that was a new album that was well, well, yes, but now we're talking about classic rock bands that, right. that you know we're talking about the Journeys, the Def Leppards, the White Snakes, the Twisters, the oh, Judas yeah. Priest, yeah, uh, out now, now Iron Maidens, right? So we have an obligation to our fans to give them what they want. I believe that you do that. I don't believe you play for yourself. I believe you play for them. Now that's a philosophy we have. It's a philosophy that always works. You can never make a mistake by giving the fans what you want. However, most bands will go, oh man, I don't, that song, I've done it a million times, oh man, I'm so tired of this, oh man, I phoned it in, oh man, I can't wait to get to the new song. And my response is, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> because I don't give a shit. If I like your band, and I had those first five albums, and they impregnated my brain for the, the, from the ages of 13 to 18, I don't really give a shit that you've come up with a new record. <laughs> you know, I've noticed this with a couple of bands. They come up with a new album and they go on a tour. Now, arguably, you need a new product to promote a tour. I get it. So, like, they triumphantly, first week on the tour, they're playing five songs for the new album. Yeah. Well, they learn that ain't working. So, yeah. the next week, they're playing four songs for the new album. And that ain't working. And the next week, they're playing three songs for the new album. You watch them towards the end of that tour, and they're playing one song, and they're praying to get out of it. Like, <laughs> can we stick it in between two of these other big hits just so we can say we played it and yeah. get the hell out of here? Yeah, yeah. Because nobody cares. So when the fans say they care, yeah. and they think that I'm being too judgmental right. and too arrogant, what I'm saying to you as a performer is 95% of you don't care. 5% of you do, and that's fine. But I'm... Pay, I'm playing to the 95% who just know the big ones yeah, and they'll go home happy and that's what I care about. So you can't make everybody happy, which is true, but if you can make 95% happy, you're doing better than most and most bands don't do that. Most bands just perform poorly, play poorly, do not understand their audience, make major mistakes in their arc of a performance. I have to tell you, man, Dean, I have... I don't think I've seen one headliner. No, that's not true. I'll tell you the two bands that that understood it. ACDC, one hundred percent, completely understood it. Yep. I saw ACDC however many years ago. I stood up the whole. I was like sixteen years old. Yep. I couldn't have been backstage. I was out with my wife. We're like standing up, and I'm in heaven. They got it a hundred percent. They they uh, they gave me. Um, they made me happy that they're that they could do that for me. I could still make me happy. Right. Live, right. So ACDC nailed it. And Priest, I, last time I saw Priest, they played a private party for Eddie Trunk. Oh, yeah. And they nailed it 100%. I don't know what they're doing on this latest tour. Their manager, Jane, is one of my oldest and dearest friends. Right. Uh, but, but you have to understand, Twisted Sister 
built its sound on ACDC and Priest. If you really want to look and ana analyze how we congealed our guitar tones. So That's that where it comes from? Yeah. That's the, wow. Yeah. So when we played with Priest in 1980, we opened up for him almost 40 years ago at, uh, this, at this theater. In, 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 um, Is that the British Steel Tour? Uh, 1980? It could have been. I can't, I can't say. But they were, you know, we opened up for them at the Boardwalk in, in Asbury Park. And we were the special guests because they needed to help sell tickets, and we were huge in the tri-state area. And we very well may have been responsible for selling five or 600 tickets. And I'm sure and the kids did, did go all over. Kids loved it. But I sat in the balcony when Priest came on. Yeah. And I sat there. And as good as Twisted was, up until that point, I looked at Priest and I went, damn. Yeah. That's a band. Like, whoa. That's – that tech the technical aspects of their guitar playing and the engine that they thrust out uh, out there uh, so i went backstage and looked at their amp setup and bought the same same, Marshall, Marshall, same yeah. we had we did the same thing yeah. i wanted that sound so i give priest all that credit for schooling us and being that we never played with acdc but um we have played with priest and we've actually been on on bills and and i will watch them because i love that band yeah, you know, I do too. I love that band. I do too. Oh, by the way, I also tell you who else I loved, Dio. Dio loved, unbelievable. Dio. Loved him. Saw him was Sabbath, but saw him. We played with him a ton. Yeah. And Dio, great guy, phenomenal singer, super showman, great musicians, always. Yeah. Never copped out. Sang like a motherfucker, and was always right. So those, I'd say maybe those three were always, always, you know. Uh, all my respect. Yeah. All my respect to them, uh, without a doubt. Ne like I said, never played with ACDC and love them. But for the most part, 99% or everybody else, nothing. Yeah. Nothing at all. Just like, uh, okay. Were you into the uh, punk scene when it was hitting down there at CBGB's? No, because Twisted was playing in the bars. I got gotcha. you. So we, we were aware of it. Yeah. When the Ramones... You know, Twisted was together before Van Halen, and Twisted's sister was together before the Ramones to put the time frames exactly. together. Exactly, 72. Had. Yeah, 72, 73. You know, Van Halen was 76, right. 77, and, and, and Ramones was 75. So in the summer of 75, a girl who I was dating for a short period of time dragged me down to CBS to see the Ramones on a Sunday evening at like 6 in the evening. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the day show. Whatever. Day show. Matinee show. And there was like 50 people in the room. And... You know, this is my comment about the punk scene. If, 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 if in the 70s I was a distillation of trying to be a great guitar player, the punk scene was the exact opposite of trying to be great players, right? So I wasn't... I, 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 from a business standpoint, I'm like, eh, these guys can't play. So I'm watching the Ramones. I'm thinking they're funny. Yeah. They're funny. Yeah. And so this ain't going anywhere. They're funny. It, it's funny. Joey was wearing a Jaws t-shirt because Jaws was the movie that summer. So I remember thinking, well, that's interesting. He's wearing a sociologically connected t-shirt. So maybe I should start thinking about things to say on stage that, that connect with people sociologically. So I stole that idea from them completely, which is make which wear or say something topical about the, the subject of the day because people will connect with it. That was the first thing I thought of when I saw Joey wearing the Jaws t-shirt. I thought the band was, frankly, terrible. I just, because I was evolved as a player, you know? I had come up and I, you know, learned my blues chops and, and I was with guys who studied really great bass players and great drummers and then all of a sudden, three chords, eh? Yeah. So... Although over time I have learned to appreciate the distillation of what they did, um, I wasn't enamored of it when I first saw it. I thought it was a joke. So, right. And Mendoza, my bass player, was in The Dictators. Well, so, wow. I mean, you know, yep. let's talk about that. You know, they toured with everybody. The Ramones, they toured with ACDC on their first, na ACDC's first national tour. The Dictators were the opening band. Wow. You know? So Mark, Mark played tons of shows with, um, with Bon Scott. Wow, man, that's fucking yeah. Amazing. And then they opened up for Foreigner on their first tour. Talk about going from ACDC to the point of the dictators. Wow, so for Foreigner. Then Mark went to England, you know, and they were with the Damned and all yeah. those bands because yeah. the dictators were a proto punk band and they yeah. were all loved over there. But you know, if you talk to guys in New York about English punk, they'll say that it was a bunch of Jews from Queens who did it as a joke and the English took it seriously. That's yeah. kind of like 
if you look at the dictators and you look at the Ramones and you say to yourself, they kind of, they kind of did it with a tongue in cheek joke and the Brits took it as a real statement about their urban fight with yeah. youth. And, and you right. know, so they kind of ran with it seriously. So then I say to myself, seriously, do I even like it? I, I don't know. I find it marginally entertaining. I thought uh, the clash were okay. People said the clash were God. Oh yeah. I, I love them. I'll say that the sex pistols, however, Never mind the Bullocks is one of my favorite all time albums. What a great record, right? Sick record. That's a, it, a lot of people go, "What's the greatest debut of all time? Is it Appetite? Is it Van Halen one?" It's like, how how are you not talking about the Sex Pistols record, which is just a smash in the yeah, face? It could be. You're right there. Yeah. Appetite is a spectacular debut album. Boston's yep. a spectacular debut album. Killer, killer, and Sex Pistols is a spectacular debut record. Without a doubt, these are. You know, when people say to me, what's the greatest live album? I say Rock and Roll Animal, Lou Reed. And I've yet to hear a live album that's better than that. And right. it's Lou Reed. And the last person in the world you'd think would make a great live record, but he hired the best freaking musicians, Hunter and Wagner. I don't know if you're familiar with Rock and Roll Animal. Absolutely, but it, it absolutely. Is, I, yeah. I think it's the greatest live album ever recorded. For me, it's If You Want Blood, because that's when I first oh. hear ACDC. Okay. And I'm just kind of like, what the fuck is this? It was like, wow. It really felt like some kind of serious punch in the face. Yeah. Well, whatever it is that whatever does it, it is, for yeah. you. Yeah. Whatever it is that does it. Yeah. So we're, we're of that age where we appreciate these certain records that are seminal. Like, I don't know what millennials think anymore about this yeah. stuff, but it meant everything to us. It really did. Sex Pistols uh, was so mind-blowing in every aspect of it. I didn't know if they were a con job or not, but I didn't care. Because unlike the Ramones, it was some serious shit going down there. And the playing was phenomenal on that record, by the way. And I yeah. understand that studio guys actually played oh, on that, that right? record. Yeah, I understand the guitar playing was actually done by... Chris Spedding. It's not uh, Steve Jones? Uh, not from what I hear. Wow. I hear that. It's not, because I wondered why it was so good. Yeah. Like it's so tight. Uh, and I heard that Chris Spedding did the guitar parts on the record. Holy I shit. Mean, you know, however, I saw Glenn Matlock play Punk Unplugged a couple of years ago at the City Winery downtown. I have to tell you, Dean, one of the fun, you know, you're a comedian. Yeah. So you can imagine this. When I saw him advertise at the wine bar, and it's a wine bar, it's a yeah. small little wine bar, and it says Punk Unplug, and it was, it was a Sylvain Sylvain and, uh, and Glenn Matlock, right? Wow. So Sylvain opens and Glenn. So we all know Glenn's written all these amazing songs. So I'm thinking to myself, it's a wine bar. What is he going to do? Sit with an acoustic guitar and have everybody drink Merlot and sing Sex Pistols songs, which would be the antithesis of what the Sex Pistols ever meant. 100%. You know? So I go down there, and lo and behold, Glenn Matlock is sitting there, and he's like, all right, that next song is called uh, No Future, you know, so I want you to pick up your pick up your wine glasses, oh, God save the queen, we're all going to practice singing No Future, and everyone's holding their glasses of Merlot, and he's going to the count of three, No Future, No Future for you, and I'm thinking, if you had said to Johnny Rotten in 1976, by the way, what's going to happen in 40 years is, <laughs> you guys are going to be playing a wine bar, <laughs> and you're going to be like toasting with red wine, oh. and he'd go, fuck you, man, yeah. fuck you, man, that would never yeah. happen, man, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, man, we're the sex business, man, fuck you, yeah. no. and yet here he is with a, a holding <laughs> glasses. That's on. insane. Him and Syl, <laughs> like drinking wine, singing. But don't forget a bunch of cell phones filming it. <laughs> oh, and cell phones filming it. Imagine how crazy that shit is. I mean, I have to tell you, as a, as a humorist, I'm stunned, completely stunned. So then Syl did a bunch of doll songs, unplugged. Yeah. Personality crisis on an acoustic guitar. I'm sorry. It's just bizarre. That is weird. Then after Glenn Matlock, then they both came out and they did Bang a Gong, which was okay. And then they did um, All or Nothing by the Small Faces, which yeah. was kind of cute. But still in all, to hear, yeah. to hear EMI... <laughs> God save the queen while they're drinking Merlot. Man, that's insane. That's crazy. That's actually almost sounds like a Saturday Night Live sketch. It, it is a Saturday Night Live <laughs> sketch. I explain this to people who don't quite get the irony, but you do get the irony. Yeah. Not intended to do this. Not at all. Okay. It was, Not it was, at all. I had to go, though. I had to see it. What, what do you do now, man? Uh, well, I, know, I, I know you do, do a I write writing. for. I write for... Goldmine Magazine. Yep. I write a Beatle column, which I love, called Now We're 64. They let me write crazy stories about the Beatles that sounds stuff cool. like really cool stuff that other people don't write just how I view the world with Beatles and the people I meet and the kind of stories I can extract from them yeah I write an audio column for Copper which is an online magazine that you get through PS Audio it's P like St. Peter S's and Sam Audio 
Copper is their magazine that's attached to their PS Audio website, which sells high-end equipment. If you go and you click Copper Magazine, you'll see covers of all the issues, and then you'll see a little hamburger on the side. And if you click it, it'll come down with authors for articles. And my articles are titled Twisted Systems. Oh, wow. And I can write anything I want. So I just did a whole, I did four essays on my favorite guitar players. My fifth essay is coming up uh -huh. on Mick Ronson because wow. he's one of my yep. all time because Bowie and Ziggy Stardust talk about insane records and what they mean to you in your life. That meant Incredible. So I talk Have about you Mick been Ronson. to the Bowie thing? Exhibit? Not yet. Yeah, let's I go to see that. I need, I need to go. You want to go? I need to go. When does it end? July 15th. I need to see it probably when I'm back from, Berm from Bermuda um, That's fine. last week of June, but we'll yeah, definitely figure it out. Go. Um, and I write for Inc. I write a business column for Inc. And I have a book deal through Rosetta Books where I'm writing a, a story of my life, which is a very twisted life so far, I guess. Yeah. That's what it's called. But it, that could change. And I, do, and I have a motivational speaking company. And which you can reach me by emailing me at frenchmgmt uh, at gmail.com. And you can hire me. And I, it's all business-based. So when people say to me, what do I talk about? You know, I talk about the twisted effect. And what is the twisted method? The twisted method is basically um, success through, this, through the prism of heavy metal. I was watching a woman who wrote a book called Grit. And the, the fundamental thesis of the book is that people who do great things have grit so she describes you know grit is the element of the personality that drives you totally. and i'm watching this woman and she's on tv and she's talking yeah you know, she wrote a whole book on grit you know and i kind of get the thesis behind it but i'm thinking to myself well grit may work you know if you're like an olympic swimmer because you need to get up at four o'clock in the morning and do this for like 20 years and a skater so but running a band business it's one word doesn't cut it so i start writing words down like stuff that i think i did which is inspiration discipline stability trust education um tenacity wisdom like i started writing all these words down i started changing the letters around i got tenacity wisdom inspiration stability trust education discipline well that what does that spell t-w-i-s-t-e-d twisted yeah so i wow. teach the twisted method and it, and i and I, I sit with corporations and i teach them business applications and they're the initial thing is he's a heavy metal guy must be a drug addict high school dropout you know how could he be telling us but the difference is that i'm successful in business and so therefore i know how to explain how to handle challenges in business and that's what i do so if you go to inc.com the magazine for example if you put JJ French, J Y J A Y F R E N C H slash Inc, I N C, not Inc as in tattoo, Inc right. as in incorporated.com, you will see 45 articles. And you can hit any one of them and you'll see a lesson. So, what I usually tell people to hire me is go down my list of 45 articles, pick the two or three you like, and we'll talk about those. So, that's how that works. Wow. You uh, read The War of Art? No. Yeah. It's an interesting book about how most people uh, sabotage their own, you know, their own drive and their own, their own, uh, what they want, you know, just. So obviously you read this book. Yeah, it's an interesting book because I know uh, I recognize a lot of my, uh, as much as, um, as much drive and ha stuff I have, I do make mistakes. And um, when you read something like that, y you know, when you're making a mistake, this is a, you know, sometimes I'll make the classic mistake of like, okay, I know I need to sit down and write, but I also, you know, I know writing's going to be the challenge for the next week or so, so I'll keep putting it off with other stuff like, well, I better answer these emails first to make sure I got work. Oh, well, I better do the podcast editing and just to keep put it, putting that off. Uh, a lot of times I think with writing is if you just do it once a day for even an hour, if you even don't even come up with something, but you sit down and, and do the thing, eventually stuff starts coming out. But if you keep pushing it away, uh, then you're going to fail. Well, I look at exercise the same way. People go, oh, I don't want to get to a gym. I don't want to walk. And I always say, walk for the first five minutes and then stop. And chances are you won't stop but you just need to do it, but don't put the pressure on yourself to have to. So when writing, and I'm in the same situations, I have to produce for my magazines all the yeah. time, and I keep putting it off, doing emails and going out and doing errands, but then when I sit down, I finally click on new story, and I come up with my headline, it starts to go, and I have to stop myself and do it. I find the biggest 
problem with great artists who shoot themselves in the foot. I call them basement Mozarts. What do you call them? Basement Mozarts. Okay. Because they criticize everybody else in the world for doing shit wrong. And they could be very talented, but they can't get out of their own way. They just are stuck in their basement for the rest of their life. And I find that, you know, I am the least talented guitar player from the whole group of guitar players that I came out of in New York City in the 60s. If you, if you went to Central Park and you picked out the 10 kids who were all 16, 17, who were all messing around on acoustic guitars, I was without a doubt the least talented of them. But I was the most driven. Right. So that's really the key. I was driven, and I am driven, and I'm restlessly driven. So it means I'm driven, and I'm restlessly driven to finish. And most people don't. They start and never finish. Right. And you need to finish things. You know, you really need to say, I got to get it done. You really have to. And if you do, you can build on it. But it's so easy to say it. it the discipline that's why in the twisted method when i teach discipline when i say that's the d of t-w-i-s-t-e-d the discipline of getting things done that's uh, that's a that's a bitch but if everybody had all of those attributes then there'd be no one to buy it because <laughs> yeah. someone has to be that unique person that can service and produce a product that the average guy wants because the average guy's not going to sit there and do it the average guy's doing something else yep or average woman. And it doesn't mean that what they're doing isn't important. They're raising a good kid. That's important. All these things are important. Um, I will say, however, that at one point, I have 37 gold and platinum records. Most of them are in storage right now. But Yeah, look around. There's no Twisted Sister stuff here. There, there is in the office. I, I, yeah, There's a little about bit. eight of them. But I have like 37. At one point, they were all in the front room. Yeah. Because I had an active business. So I had them all so that you walked in and you needed sunglasses. And one day, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at that wall, right? And I'm alone. And I'm looking at that wall. And there's 37 gold and platinum records. I'm thinking, man, if I was 10 years old and you said to me, when I saw the Beatles on TV and I said, I want to be a rock star. And you said, well, this is what you're going to have. And I looked at that picture. I go, I must be the richest, greatest, most famous. What a life. What a great life. Like this, this is what I'm thinking if I'm 10 or 15. And I'm looking at all those records on the wall and I'm saying, man, the price I paid, the price I paid to get it, was it worth it? That's the question I asked myself. Was it worth it? Was it? Two marriages down the drain. Yeah. Relationships blown up. Lawsuits. Bankruptcies. Two heart operations. Whoa. Yeah. For a regular heartbeat, which had nothing to do with anything, but, you know, a daughter with uh, an, an eye disease that's controllable, but it's a leading cause of blindness among girls. I mean, there's, the thing is, it's life, right? It's yeah. life. It's not happily ever after life. It's life. And, 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 I, look at it and I looked at it and I said, man, I, the answer is not clear to me. The answer is not, yeah, it was absolutely worth it. That's not the answer. The answer was the price I paid for it was massive. The fact I'm still standing is ridiculous because the price I paid was re was ridiculous so that's my view of what my success is yeah is um it's successful to the average person i've lived a life that you know is kind of larger than most people's and and i've had crazy experiences and i you know i was almost murdered as a drug dealer i od'd on heroin i you know i I, that all could have ended when I was 20. That all could have happened at 20. Then I turn around, become completely straight, put a band together, struggle for 10 years, and then, you know, and then, then the band gets signed, then we have an amazing future, and then we explode in, in 1988 with lawsuits. Everyone gets sued, and I have to file for bankruptcy, and I lose everything. Wow. And I, and, then, and I have to start all over, and my wife and I divorce, and then I'm broke, and I'm bankrupt, and I have nothing. And then I remarry and I get a job as a stereo salesman. Well, first of all, I, I couldn't work. I, I, I got a job working pool overnights at a pool hall. That's you know? So you go from twisted sister. To actually working overnights at a pool hall to make money. That's insane. Now, yeah. who sued you? Was it the record company? No, it was a, it was a merch company. A merch? Oh, we, that's we, right. I remember yeah, that because, yeah. 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 So, so, um, so, uh, because you sudden, couldn't do the tour or whatever? We, the tour failed and they wanted their money back, even though we had made, even though they'd made millions off of Madonna and Springsteen. 
And I said, I can't believe you guys are coming after us. And I forgot after. about so that. So all of a sudden, I walk out of bankruptcy court. Look, I know what I'm getting into. I'm not an idiot. I understand what yeah. happened. Because you got an advance on the merch. Yeah, but understand this. There's three kinds of people in this world. There's people who make it happen, people who watch it happen, people go, what happened? 99% of the people go, what happened? I'm never going to be one of those people. Yeah. I'll, I'll either make it happen or watch it happen, but I'm never going to go, what happened? So I knew what was coming. But I didn't believe it was going to come, and when it did, I was confronted with the reality of the fact that I had a file, and when I filed, I lost everything. So um, I found myself in 1988 walking out of bankruptcy court with two guitars and a subway token, and that was my sum of what was left over wow. for, the, for all those hard-fought years of twisting. From and, a, a massive, massive MTV star... Yeah. To bankrupt and working at a pool oh, hall. So a friend of mine owned a pool hall, and he, and he had a nephew that he said to me, let's manage my nephew. And we got him a deal pretty quick when I needed money. So he said, Why he goes, I just opened up a pool hall with my partners. Why don't you come run the pool hall overnight? And he said, I'll tell people that you're a part owner, so it saves you the embarrassment. Wow. But I was just an overnight manager. Wow. Of a pool hall. For like, and then you start selling hi-fi. Well, then so that lasted nine months, and then... I managed his nephew f f uh, for a couple of years who got two amazing record deals and fell apart. And then I got married, had a second marriage, a kid, and then I said, fuck it all. And I, I started selling hi-fi because I've been a, into high-end hi-fi since I was 15. What got you in an early Macintosh? Uh, no, nah, Dyna stuff, Dynaco stuff, because Mac was way beyond what I could afford back yeah, when I first Yeah, I got Morant, yeah, 2275. That was, that, that was you know, way more expensive than I could afford. Yeah. I had Dyna, and I had an AR turntable for 78 bucks. And the thing is, I know the history of Hi-Fi. Hi so there's a well-known Hi-Fi store in New York that I used to be a client of, and, and the guy kind of just said, hey, man, I don't see you working these days. You, you, know, you know more about this shit than people who work here. You want to work, you offered me a job. So I got a job working there for four years. And then in the middle of that job, Seven Dust, who I'd been kind of working with as different band names over the last eight years from Atlanta, evolved. And then they said, they were called Crawl Space, and they said, would you do our demos? And I said, no. Why did they come to you? Oh, uh, fuck if I know. That's crazy. Well, because the band started as a band called Red Threat, which turned into Roulette, which turned into Cupid's Arrow, which turned into Snake Nation, <sighs> which turned into Stiff Kitty over like a seven-year period of time, and they kept shedding members. And finally, when they became Crawl Space, the drummer of Stiff Kitty or Snake Nation, I can't remember which guy, remembered that I was making demos trying to get him record deals. And then finally, after the end of Snake Nation, my wife said, enough, you know, you've done enough. You were a rock star. It's not, you're not going to have a second shot. Honestly, it's not going to happen again. So don't, you know, get a job. So I got a job. So they called me up, and I said, I'm not going to get involved. And then I... I said, okay, I'll do a demo. And I did a demo of theirs, and I brought it up to New York, and we got a deal in nine months with TVT. And then I produced the album with Mark Mendoza, and then I managed the band. The band became one of the biggest bands of the year in 1998. I and just remember all of a sudden an in. infomercial at night for them, right? Yeah, it was yeah, like Seven Dust yeah. infomercial. Yeah. I was like, what is this? Yeah, yeah, so the label got behind them, and, and the record became massively popular, and I managed the band. And then... Believe it or not, I was making 10 times more money than I ever made in Twisted Sister. Wow. With them, managing them. I was wow. ro rolling in money. I couldn't, I, I was working, st selling stereo equipment for 500 a week and making thousands on a, a week managing them. And, I, and then I bought a house and all of a sudden I'm, I'll, all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I'm like for here, I'm here, here. Now I'm way here. And like, oh, well, this is incredible. Like, so I quit the jobs in stereo stores. I didn't need it anymore. Managed them full time and, and just was doing made more money than I'd ever made in my life. And, That's incredible. And I was blown away by the fact that it happened. I couldn't believe it. And then just as that was reaching its peak, my wife tells me she's leaving me for another guy oh. and the band fires me for management. So it's not, it all comes crashing down. Oh, and and as it all comes crashing down again, um, Twisted started two months after that and we've been riding high ever since. So it's, it's an interesting life. Like my brother is fond of saying to me, that um, 
we lived very different lives. My brother said, you know, he was a school teacher. He liked a nice, even life. He was a 30 years in a union. Then he retired. Then he got a job as a private school teacher. And he got another pension. He just, you know, he likes this. This yeah. is my brother. Yeah. He goes, but you, you know, you're a drug dealer. as a hippie. You almost die of a drug overdose. Somehow you, you kick drugs at 20. Then you start a band for 10 years. You're like this. And then all of a sudden, you become one of the biggest bands in the world. And just as that all happens, it all comes crashing. And you come falling down to here. And now you're down to here. And you're working overnights in a pool hall. And you got no fucking money then you remarry again then all of a sudden for some reason seven does comes along blah, 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 and now you're back up to here and just when you're back up to here your wife second wife leaves you the band fires you now you're down to here and then just when you're down to here all of a sudden twisted sister decides because the world wants you back or even though you didn't think that anybody cared and for the last 14 years you're up to here and he, my brother looked at me and he said how do you do that? <laughs> and I looked at my brother and I went, fuck, I don't know. Like, I, I never thought about it. It wears before. you out, right? You know, well, no, you know, I looked at my brother. I said, man, I, I said, here's the deal. I was born with asbestos underwear. And he said, what do you mean? I said, entrepreneurs can stand the heat. I said, and the world needs people like you and the world needs people like me. And that's what makes the world go around. So I've been very fortunate. But I've taken huge, huge hits like along the way along the way two hard operations you know and it's almost like uh being a a professional gambler you, you know you you you're you're always betting on yourself sometimes you win big and sometimes you lose it all well i can add something else to you that i have not mentioned when is this going to be broadcast uh well it, it, soon like next week okay so you'll be the first one to know this okay i'm about to tell you all right. I'm a prostate cancer survivor. Wow. Wow. I was diagnosed uh, in March and I had an operation in April and um, they tell me I'm cured, but I've been they've been watching me for 15 years cuz my father died of it. Oh wow. So you're going to get it. the camera? Uh, I'm sorry. Were you going in and getting the camera like uh Oh, no, they went in and removed. They I had the I had a radical operation. They they removed it and it was No, uh, but I mean once you find out that your dad died from it, are you going in and getting Oh, the my my father died in 84 and then right. starting in 2004, they started watching me carefully and my brother carefully and we knew this wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. So when it finally diagnosed itself, we finally came up. I had to deal with it. I had to proactively deal with it. So seven weeks ago yesterday, I went in the hospital. And had wow. It. And, uh, you know, I'm going to write about it in Inc. Magazine. I'm going to go into depth about the whole process. I don't go to Facebook. I don't do all that shit. Right. I'm not a thoughts and prayers kind of guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm basically, a, just give me a surgeon. That knows so you didn't I'm tell doing. anybody. You just went in and got the surgery. Do you have health care? Hell yeah. Wow. Dude, I'm on Medicare, my friend. Wow. You are on Medicare. I'm 65. I friend. forgot. Plus, I have after SAG after, which is amazing healthcare. So shit. So it didn't didn't cost me really anything at all. So but, they went in there and cut it out. Yeah, they took it out, and they it looks like they got all of it. Oh my god. So, um, so add that to another chapter. Oh my god! Right yeah. there you go, man. I think when we look at the whole history of Twisted Sister, it all comes around your luck, not anybody else's. I don't know about that. It's for someone else to deduce, but I will say that. Um, when I had my heart operations 10 years ago, the first one failed, almost killed me, and the second one cured me. And, uh, and that was, I faced mortality then. So I faced mortality in that now. Wow. In a way, you know, I mean, because we didn't know when, we didn't know how, how it was going to look, you know, until they removed it and took a look at it to see if it was gone or not gone. And even still, you know why they tell people who have cancer, you're not cured for five years? Because microscopically, yeah. something can be in your bloodstream yep. like, or in your glands microscopically that they may not have seen and they need to follow it up for years to make sure. Right. According to their analysis, they apparently never never escaped, never went anywhere. They got it. Um, but I certainly am a pro when it comes to it. And I don't want to spend this conversation discussing all I know about it because yeah. I know a ton of it. Yeah. Let's just say that um, I did a ton of research, a ton. Wow. I analyzed every version of, of solution to the problem and got the best doctor and made, this, made the best choice for me. Wow. And since it's such a high percentage disease so many men get it 
this is not going to be an unusual situation. I can tell you that I have about 10 guys who have had it who got me through it by explaining to me what they went through. And I intend, when I write for my next article, to impart the same amount of information. To sound like an old cliche, if I can help one guy, yeah. if one person hears me and says, wow, J.J. did it, he confronted it, and he's, he came out okay, I need to do that too. Don't put your head in the sand about it. Yeah. Be proactive, because you don't want it to kill you. you know. And so um, I'm here telling you that... Uh, that I'm what do you think people should do? Get checked, right? Well, get checked, first of all. Absolutely, always get checked. Yeah. PSA isn't always an indicator, but it can be. So if your PSA is above four, you should really look into... Blood tests? Uh, well, that's a blood test. Then right. There's, then there's MRIs, and then there's biopsies, and then there's an operation. Right. Uh, biopsies yeah. are not fun. No. They're like being raped by Edward Scissorhands. They're not fun, Ooh. but I've had six of them. Wow. Yeah. They go in there and scrape? Mm, no, I can't even get into it. It's fucked up. Right. It's really not It's Ooh. not a happy Ooh. thing unless you're knocked out, which I wasn't for the first five biopsies. Wow. I was awake. Not fun. Wow. Um, but let's just say that you have to be proactive. And if your responsibility is to your family, if you want to live first, then you figure it all out later. So don't talk to me about, oh, man, does sex suck? Does this suck? Does that suck? You know what? It may or may not suck. Yeah. But you need to live first. And Absolutely. And then you figure it out. And, yeah. And I have to tell you, when I talk to my friends about it, I always I said to all of them, what was your response when they told you you had to make this decision? And when you made this decision, how did you view the decision? And they all said the same thing to me. This is the guys who decided to have the removed versus radiation. Because yeah. radiation was another option. Right. But radiation, your prostate stays in you. Yeah. So you have to hope that they get it because if they don't, they can't remove a prostate that's already been affected with radiation because it changes the shape of the prostate and the texture of the prostate and this prostate can't be removed. Oh, wow. So you're really limiting your options. However, to be fair, plenty of people do survive with radiation. So let me be fair about that. I concluded to have it removed and the two things that were said to me by all the guys, none of whom knew each other, but just when I said, why did you choose it? They all said, because I wanted it the fuck out of my body. Yeah. That's number one. And number two, and I said to them, what about the sexual in, in, in the continence? They said, dude, I'm going to live first. I'll figure out the rest later. Yeah, fuck that. I didn't understand it, but now I completely right. understand it. So again, if, if this, if, Dean, if this is a PSA, a public service announcement, yeah. then I'm announcing it on your podcast. Wow. And, and telling you. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, congrats, man. That is just so amazing. I mean, I'd rather be alive than fucking, you can't fuck dead. And so it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It doesn't fucking matter, yeah, dude. No, you can't, you can't. And uh, up until Viagra, most people didn't fuck <laughs> after 60 well, I, anyway. I'm top of it anyway. So anyway. Yeah. Um, God, yeah. congrats, man. So there man. you go. So the, so the stories don't end. In the yeah, the stories don't end. No, um, let me ask you this and then I'll get out of here. Do you think twisted sister will ever play again i used to swear we would never play again after 1988 i swore it would never happen so the fact that we did after 12 years was amazing i thought we would last two years we lasted 14 i will be an idiot to say we'll never play again yeah but i don't see a scenario that would uh, would have us play again uh, except for some stupid offer by a couple of promoters right my head is so not into playing right now like I don't know, by the way, I'm not speaking for Eddie. I'm not speaking for Mark, and D's out playing. So obviously, yeah, he's got the play. new solo record coming yeah, out. But um, I have, I, at this moment in my life, have no desire to play again. But I've done that before. Yeah. I've said it before. When Twisted ended in 88, I didn't touch a guitar for five years. Wow. I sold them all. I didn't have any. And, yeah. I, and I didn't play for five. I don't think it was five years went by before I picked up a guitar. So, I mean, right now I have nice guitars out, but I haven't picked them up in six months. So yeah, yeah. I haven't picked them up. But, um, but I love our fans. I love them. I love the fact they gave us a second life that yeah. made us bigger than we ever were. We're bigger now than ever. Our Spotify numbers are bigger than ever. ever. Everything is bigger than ever. The legend is bigger than ever. Documentary is insane. Thank you. Who did um, the documentary? Who paid for that? Andrew Horn, the director. Gotcha. What a great job he did. Um, so, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd be an idiot to say we will never play again. Yeah. I just don't. Uh, I'm not seeing the, the, the. Look, 
Next year, 2019, next May is the 35th anniversary of Stay Hungry. Oh, yeah. So if I needed, to, if I needed to figure out a marketing plan, why not record two new songs, stick it on a reissue of Stay Hungry and go out and yeah. play a couple of shows, a couple in New York, a couple of LA or something, or, or go to Europe, and it could happen. Just go out and play that record. Yeah, I, so I don't know. People lose their fucking yeah, mind. I don't know, but, you know, possibly. Are the, rema- are the vinyls by the record label remastered off the original masters because there is a cash grab on a lot of labels now where they're just throwing the vinyl out. All the stuff that was remastered when it was on Eagle Rock was remastered off of the analog masters. Gotcha. Uh, that was positively done. Nobody nobody um, mastered off of a digital copy. Good. As far as I know, it was all done off of, awesome. except for maybe... Maybe you can't stop rock and roll because they couldn't find them. But we found them now because they're coming out of vinyl. So all the vinyls come. You know, can't we have um, uh, in August uh, Live of the Marquis coming out of vinyl? Wow. Yeah, it only came out on limited CD a couple of years ago. Wow. So it's coming out on vinyl, and so is um, so is uh, Under the Blade? rock and roll. Oh wow. Uh, to commemorate the 35th anniversary of both those shows, so that's what's coming out in August. Then we have Club Days Three coming out, which is going to involve, which is going to include ten cover songs that we've never released cover songs back recorded in 1980 at a club, which Whoa. I just found a video of. I never, I never seen it. I found it. I'm watching us playing all this, all covers by Van Halen, Judas Priest, ACDC. I am sitting there. I mean, I'll show you when we shut this off. A uh, couple of songs will blow you oh, away how tight that. we are, taken from a, a video camera of a. Of a of recording in 1980 so we're cleaning that up and hopefully that'll be out so that'll be out sometime in the fall then we have the 35th anniversary of Stay Hungry coming out then of course you got the 35th anniversary of Come Out and Play who knows what that's going to mean so there's occasions to continue to keep the Twisted Sister legend going but the the fans do it and um, I miss the fans they're great Oh, man, we miss you, man. I, after I saw that gig, I was just, I can't even tell you how much I talked about it. I've been talking about it since it happened. I mean, Ricky Rackman and I were just like, what the fuck? Can you just believe the power coming off here, man? The power was just like, it was like just hitting yeah. us. We're two feet away, man. I just, oh, man, I can't thank you enough for doing the thank show. Thank you, man. What a, well, I'm, you. I'm so glad that uh, everything's happened, you know, good, man, uh, health-wise, you know. Yeah. Uh, health is all we got. I got diabetes a couple of years ago, lost 40 pounds, went to the gym, got rid of it, you know. Um, That's funny because I lost 25. I, I don't suggest having this as a great weight. Yeah. Weight, but <laughs> it's I lost, not a good diet. But I, lost, but I lost weight from it. <laughs> all right, that I can tell you. Yeah, yeah, the prostate cancer diet. Great. Wow. Wow, man. Uh, you know, I've, 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 in the six years I've been doing this show, once in a while somebody hits me with something, and it's, uh, it's why I love doing this show, because it's just so organic and like, oh, my God, I'm glad you're here. And I can't imagine if uh, it got you and I never got to t- have this conversation in your place in New York City, man. So uh, thank, you. thank you so much for having me. All right, man. And, uh Get out there and get this Twisted Sister uh, reissues on vinyl. Everybody that listens to my show are vinyl heads. And uh, thank you so much, man. Thank you, buddy. I'll see you guys. Uh, yeah. Make sure you subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel now. It's uh, Dean Del Rey on YouTube. And uh, subscribe and, uh, and uh, review on iTunes. Candles lit. <laughs>